Recording in progress. Um, we're normally up on a thousand gallons a day. We're at six out of hundred today. Wow. Uh, but we're we're back to treating everything within state permit requirements, hmm. cool. which we obviously couldn't for a while, and neither could anyone else in the area. Um, and really, uh, in working on the, on the FEMA part of it and beginning that, it's really Winooski Street. Yeah. There were a couple of culverts, uh, some issues, some washouts on the gravel, but nothing that wasn't fixed pretty quickly. <clears throat> um, so that's all good. I've also already confirmed with FEMA that the towns that loaned us labor and equipment that we can claim for those towns and, and send them a check. Reimbursement. The nice. So that's, they weren't looking for that, but if the federal government will pay for it, I think it's a rational, reasonable thing to give to them. Mm -hmm. Cool. And thanks to all the volunteers and those select board members that are leading that effort because it's really turned from a municipal effort into volunteer effort at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nate, do you have something to report on the? Yeah, do you want to go to the I just, Tom, do you want to just name the municipalities publicly? I know we've done it before, but I did it before. It's important yeah. to, I think, among the many folks who deserve thanks to others that offered um, time and equipment um, with no expectation of return. Sure, Stowe gave us uh, a brand new beefy four inch water pump, which uh, helped a lot um, saving the berms at the wastewater plant. Uh, St. Albans gave us uh, the back of their truck, and I believe three and a half days of, of labor to go with it. South Burlington gave us their truck and, and a day of labor. And I forget. Um, I believe Burlington also pinched in pumping out basically yeah. for a four yeah. day or two. Yeah. Yeah. Burlington so pumped out my basement. Nice job. Um, yeah, Ready? I'll start to thank you again. It's never enough. It's really volunteers, the um, roundabout, the spreading the word and getting the word out. It's just made a huge difference the way that we're able to, able to communicate. Um, <coughs> public works comes. The library, I'm just I have to, we have to gush because the library is staying open. They're offering a place to that help assist people who need logistical support, insurance support, email application support that they wouldn't get somewhere else. So, um, like, I think the term it takes a village is they do that for water breaks, and we're not really going anymore. Um, and then an update is that we've, we've sort of turned and pivoted from large scale as many hands on the ground in as many areas as possible efforts to now honing in on the um, individual items household people who really need help um so we're toning down the big all call for all hands on deck and turning into more specific crews going to specific locations for tasks and and people who need help so um while that's happening, there will still be someone, whether it's Lish Legal, Alyssa, myself, and other volunteers here in the steel room, we expect through Friday, um, so that folks can come in if they need it. So there's ways to get in touch, whether it's waterbreakhelp at gmail.com, um, uh, or coming in here in person. Um, we're just because we're not sending lots of people, I don't want folks to think there isn't help. So that's the message I can get out. I want that message to get out. There's some things we can't do as volunteers that need professional help. We've got lists of professional um, experts who are offering either volunteer services, consultation, or to help just connect you with a professional, whether it's a contractor, a plumber, et cetera. So we'll do our best to, to, to do as much as possible before that, you know. Um, um, I, I don't think you're missing anything. I just wanted to add that the resolve of our volunteers when finishing a project and as we began to pivot to meeting smaller crews for specific um, households, when the volunteers said, what should we do next? We said, well, we've been fielding calls from other towns. And they were like, okay, and drove to the other towns to help people in surrounding areas. And I I thought that was absolutely incredible that they just spent an entire day working in Waterbury. And when we said, okay, go home, they said no. <laughs> and they went and helped somebody else. The volunteers in this town have really blown me away. Uh, and it's just been incredible to see our town come together like this. <laughs> Um, and the last I would say, just to say out loud, 
Um, there is still a form. So as of the beginning of this meeting, we had a thousand responses. Again, just to highlight how many folks, um, again, vast majority of that of folks offering help. Um, we also know, and we've said it before, but to say it again, folks are processing and understanding this event and the impacts and the needs over time. So if you haven't reached out for help and realize you really do need help, we still would love to hear from you and try and help connect you to resources um, online. The world is in a lovely, we now have banners on our municipal website, <laughs> waterburybt.com. So it's linked there. You can go to bit.ly slash Waterbury help complete that form. You can also leave a voicemail. Uh -huh. Shout out to the Google Suite. Um, 802-585-1152. And um, we will get a transcript of those voicemails. Again, just trying to match folks to resources. As was said, there is um, drop in hours at the library. Um, and again, those are included in that resource document. Um, and again, would just say like looking at serving folks we haven't reached in Waterbury, those who still need help, and like Kane alluded to, also looking at how we can share that wealth of resources and volunteers willing to help Waterbury across the state because we recognize there's widespread need. So connecting to other municipalities and groups doing this work, both about the process we use to help stand it up, and also getting those contacts so that we can spread resources you don't need to other places. And thank you again. <laughs> Do we need in the community more of the flood bucket chips? So, are we okay with that? Yeah, we got a bunch of the red cloth today. So, I know there are like five pallets in Barry. I don't want to take anything from Barry. No, I, I, the need has not exceeded what we have oh. the same year. Okay. No. I was just going to be in Barry on yeah. Wednesday and I could have told the truck to go over to that team. Anyone has sub funds? bit.ly slash waterway help. We could use a few so more. We've been matchmaking throughout the day that and dehumidifiers. Yeah, the other thing. Yeah, we do have some still coming, but they're the big ticket items and then everybody need them. Mm -hmm. And how about the demand from the surrounding <laughs> towns like Duxbury, what's going on, Moortown, um, um, and Sersingham as well? Yeah. Um, I drove out to Duxbury and Moortown. Was it yesterday? Did I do that yesterday? <laughs> I did that yesterday. Um, and Moortown, the residents of our little corner of Moortown here, um, were happy to see us. Um, they didn't really need anything. They were pumping out their own basements. They didn't have major damage. Um, visiting Duxbury was a little bit. Um, River Road in Duxbury got a lot, got hit a lot harder. But I think we or the town of Duxbury or the state or Bella even connected. Um, there was a moment in the flood where Duck or River Road didn't exist. Um, and so I visited with some residents on that road. Uh, there was a community, uh, a mobile home park, who were very frustrated with their situation. I contacted their rep and walked it with their rep. Their select board visited the site as well. So I think. Um, with the combined efforts of our town, their state rep, and their select board, that problem is going to be done. And then we have some crews going out to Middlesex tomorrow as well for folks who haven't had any help. Um, do you have to say that? Um, yeah, we fielded, <laughs> we fielded a couple calls from Middlesex and a few days ago, like right after the flood started receding and started receiving calls from Middlesex and we finally were able to get crews out there today and they were still mucking out. Mm -hmm. um, they were bad off. Uh, their, their town just doesn't have the same resources or volunteer strength that our town has had in this time and we were more than happy to <clears throat> turn our attention when we could to helping them out. From what I've heard, the update that I got was one house is getting dug out. There, there were three like major impacts major impacts on, on households and one house is getting dug out another house is unfortunately probably a lost cause and then somebody's property they lost their garage but otherwise their house is okay they're mucking out right now uh that's my update for me and uh, how about uh, the other way in bolton we have one house in bolton that actually reached out that we're working to 
offer help too. We've called back a couple times and haven't reached her. Other than that, we haven't had um, others reach out. And the uh, uh, we're two uh, households in we're Waterbury. Two, two and awesome. We're just doing great. They're in really good shape. They're in. They've had awesome volunteers out there. Today there were just a couple houses left, like literally like cleaning off the stuff, cleaning stuff that got dirty. Right. Um, there'll probably be another round of like helping move a couple things in or pick up any leftover trash, but it's really clear and the houses overall are doing really great. A lot of our main areas just have a couple, you know, follow up things like people are waiting for their dehumidifiers to finish before they can move stuff back in. And those are those kind of like specific crews will call in when it's done. And then moving dehumidifiers, et cetera, from one house to the other, that kind of thing as we go. Uh, I was talking with Madeline Drake about uh, spraying for mold. Uh, oh, thank you. Update. Um, oh, sorry. You can, I didn't mean that. No, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you've got no <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> The, the idea that I have uh, is that we connected with um, the superintendent of Harwood. Yeah, so. Okay, perfect. And he's putting us in touch with Ray, the facilities manager, who has some of those supplies that they've used in the school. We just haven't heard back from Ray yet. Mike did give me a heads up that it will probably take until tomorrow to hear back from him. Is that a reason why you're back? Um, but he, Mike, was very happy to, to loan any equipment and expertise that we could. So once we connect with Ray, we'll learn more about what equipment they have, including mold sprayers and also some new large industrial fans. So we're thinking about getting that started later this week? Yeah, as soon as soon as I can, as soon as I can connect. But we'll need his, he's also going to offer input on like the timing of like where to start mm -hmm. and how long it takes mm -hmm. that kind of Madeline Drake and I both have uh, the sprayers uh, oh. and some bleach oh, and some moldex. So. Oh, I think this is one of the Just uh, our side of the Bolton line, up the hill, front mm -hmm. of the uh, and then Shark Evil? Yeah, mm -hmm. Might be. Might be, yes. Uh, it was raining really hard. <laughs> um, the, road was, the road was a wash, the hill going up there, the dirt road washed out. I still made the trek. Uh, and I knocked on the first house door and I was like, hey, you guys, anything? your road seems washed out. And he said, no, it just looks like that. So no flood impacts, <laughs> <laughs> but a conversation separately. Yeah, so those steep dirt roads yeah. tend, to, tend to look like that. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other reports? I had a, may yes. I ask a question of you yeah. folks? With the, sure. um, there was one resident who called late this afternoon about advice using a professional cleaning company like serve pro mm -hmm. do you have any uh experience that you'd like to share with them they're, they're good but expensive okay well that was part of his question was whether it was you know financially they're very professional but they're very they're they're one of the most expensive you know remediation companies okay um you know if you have something like a, a spilled boiler and oil you, sort of, you may need them okay. uh, otherwise you may not okay i feel like that sounds like sound advice. some of the other environmental companies that do environmental assessments can do some of that work mm -hmm. and they're all not you know when you get into these big companies they're all not inexpensive but you know surf pro is probably on the top end you know Wind right. river and and ask for an estimate before you but also be more. careful who, who you go to because if you go to you know billy bob service you know you may not get the you know you may still point of having no problems after the yeah yeah his questions went a little deeper but i think i'll go over them tomorrow with the girls and see if we can come up with a with a response for him or i'll just put him in touch on uh, waterbury help Great. Right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Chris. Um, moving forward, is there any um, ideas on what discussion maybe we talked about later as far as after Irene, there was discussions about mitigation, there was discussions about areas, which is what mm -hmm. the frequency of which these things seem to be coming around. Uh, you know, we exhausted probably several different avenues long term. There's no sense in beating a dead horse twice. Um, 
but I'm just wondering from a select board member's mindset and the rest of the town, what are we anticipating for the future? Uh, how are we going to keep kind of walking the same path? We've discussed not entirely altogether as a group, but uh, we're between Tom, <coughs> I assume, uh, other than the municipal staff. Uh, the select board and other volunteers that we have in many ways have been continually keeping a running list of things we've done well, things we haven't done well, things questions we have. Um, there will be more, more than one group meeting, I assume, between departments and select board and you know what we volunteers. So in terms of what is the plan, don't know. We're gonna get through the emergency part and then start planning those meetings, but we have been actively taking notes so that we don't forget everything that's happened in the past few weeks. Well, and just, I guess, to speak more broadly about mitigation, I think candidly it's a theme that's being discussed in the state as a whole and various communities. I mean, as many are familiar, there's been a patchwork of impacts across the state and what communities were hit. And that's due to a variety of factors. But one thing that's being said is that some mitigations and efforts to make flooding less severely impact communities have worked. So understanding what those are, both here in Waterbury and other communities, is certainly of interest. I would say candidly, we're in the more active response phase still while we are ramping down volunteers. We're still at the running all day, mucking out these phase, but again, we certainly have a running list of things. Um, again, I was not in this community during our read, but certainly folks have said, you know, the difference between basement flooding and first floor flooding and the proportion that we had in this community, um, you know, some of the amounts of difference in floodplain levels, like could it help to make that difference? And the fact that we're sitting here a week later in the position we are in, some are saying could in part be due to that. So I would say personally as a select board member, certainly would want to further any other efforts. And we know there have been barriers in the past. Certainly Tom said one piece is saying this is a friendly reminder that this, you know, was considered a hundred year flood that happened in close to a decade. And is that a way to re-up folks' interest? You know, whether they were willing or not, it was certainly, you know, some sort of wake up call. But yes, I would say not active deep dive yet, but certainly on the way down. I'll toss this out back when I, after Irene, they talked about taking the field across the river and uh, extracting 300,000 cubic yards of material out and the cost of $7 million. Uh, but we have a form of honor and profit that they were doing that. And I uh, thought about it there. I hate to say this, but um, the ball field gets flooded quite a bit. Uh, is there a possibility that some of this area could be large? Would you have to offset that? Yeah, um, you know, uh, I didn't read the whole hydrological study, but the, the part that I did read was that uh, the recommendation was to remove part of Hardy Farm to allow that to flood. Um, as far as I know, the owners were informed and resisted quite strongly and did not allow that to happen. Um, I am in the mood to revisit that, yes. Mm -hmm. Gary, to yeah, say, I was involved in that process with emergency management and the owners were not going to allow it to happen. And I think it's time that uh, the state and federal government do it by eminent domain. Uh, there's a public good, it's just an easy argument, mm -hmm. but that's beyond water. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm going to officially open the public session now. Uh, mm -hmm. We've already done it, but yes. I'd like to offer one more. Uh, Could I'm you come up and stay in there? Sure. Yeah. My name is Kurt Shepard, and I live on Jimmy Davis Road, mm -hmm. and uh, we're on the west side. Uh, we were on the island in the storm. Uh, bus suggestion. Um, I think it's regrettable that the culvert at Farr's Field was not upgraded when the state rebuilt the road. Uh, that culvert is clearly undersized. I think that it's, there's a good argument now that uh, that profile should be three feet higher. And that would be, uh, you know, a worthy project for the state. Like, so that we don't have isolated sections in town as frequently as they are occurring. I've been the public works director of so for 13 years, and this is my fourth hundred year run. Mm -hmm. And specifically, the Route 2 has been cut there? I'm sorry, sir? Uh, route 2 has been uh, cut off. 
by flood water four times. was cut off in two of those four. I was not able to get home. Yeah. Thank you. But it's an example of, um, I think Chris's point, sorry, more about um, we should use this as an opportunity to figure out uh, where our, our weak spots are, and we should consider resiliency something that we have to achieve, not just aspire to. Uh, the Winooski Street Bridge needs to have double the span, and it's 100 years old. We have similar situations in the snow. I think it's the state that needs to step up on some of this. She was hoping that Greece or Tom might be here. Uh, MK. Hi, I'm the Motley Walker Center. I um, just want to say to the folks who are in here, rolling up your sleeves every day, you are appreciated. And I know it's not easy, and I'm finding myself with um, a little bit of too much to be back in it like I was after Irene. But I know that you are appreciated, and it's not easy. And thank you for doing the work you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, MK. Anyone else? Anyone up here? <laughs> Yeah, Lisa. Um, this is coming from the water water guy. I just had a couple questions, and I figured if I had these questions, um, other people can do they have them too. Um, what are the numbers that we see on the buildings around? Oh, okay. Um, that's one. Um, and can you repeat that for the crash? Has anybody checked in with the post office? I had a reader ask me this afternoon, when is the post office going to start re delivering mail? I was on the web. Um, yeah, I'm my house, I but so um, I don't know if we were aware that there's some inconsistency right now as far as mail goes. If you've heard yeah, me that, um, I've not heard no. um, that until just like a couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. message Might explain that guy not getting his tax bill yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. um, and the last okay. thing to the point that Kane mentioned before about going over to Moortown. Um, I heard yesterday from some folks in Moortown on the River Road, which is you know, over 100 feet, and you make a first hard left, and that's parallel to Route 2. Um, a little piece of Berlin actually cuts across that road, yeah. and they were on an island over there. Um, I heard from them yesterday. They're still at board meeting tonight, and they were hoping to get to that meeting tonight to see if they can get some resources, but they said that they really need help getting rid of wet, soggy things. Mm -hmm. um, they said they're on their own, they haven't had any dumpsters, they could use volunteers, so there's a bunch of houses there that they're trying to clean out and they have piles of stuff and they couldn't clean out. Um, and they were hoping they're giving their support at the benefit of the dam, but I guess their, their village didn't get much um, impact, so it hasn't been much of a response at all. Um, but it's, that, that's the one neighborhood over there that seems to be in need, but not paying much attention. Do you have a comment on I do. Lisa, I'll, I'll connect with you after the. I'll email you. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. anyway, if you can spend I know somebody in that neighborhood as well. Right. Okay. Um, do we want to answer Elisa's question about the numbers? Yeah, it's just big, big address numbers instead of really cute little address as RC numbers on doors that are hard to find by the back of truck and volunteer. So it's just for easy um, help to get there without driving around. Okay, well, someone asked me, does that, does that place need help? Should I go there? Uh, so I'm very kind. Okay. So, okay. Can, can you speak to whether they were those signs were donated or we built for them? I just, if they were donated, I wanted to acknowledge. I don't remember and we'll find out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the yeah, yeah, I can't remember if they donated or paid. I'm not sure. I just wanted to. But we appreciate them. Pack and send. Pack and send. Because yeah. I think they yeah. were not, they were like not even really open. And we said this is an emergency. Can you do it? And they did it in like zero minutes. So yeah. regardless of whether we paid, they were yeah. very helpful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
person there and oh. she was like, ah, it's because people oh, shouldn't get know. there uh, or okay. taking out themselves. So I think it's a staffing issue, but hopefully it's gotten better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll go otherwise and just see what the current status is. Yeah. Any other questions from the public at this time? Not seeing any hands up over here. No one here. Okay. Uh, next thing on the agenda is uh, permission to apply for grant funds related to implementing portions of the parks study. We wanted to get this one on the select board agenda, um, mostly because uh, the final presentation of the park study is, will be delayed a little bit, um, but that committee is meeting uh, once more, so we're hopeful that perhaps the first meeting on this would be since the park study will be presented to you and potentially adopted. Mm -hmm. Um, but this grant opportunity came out it's through building and general services and there's a few categories but um it's interested in the building communities uh sorry the recreational facilities category and even though the park study is not formally adopted i, I don't believe that the map of the uh, non disc golf course would maybe would, would change between now and then so looking at that map there's uh, accessible paths that are outlined Mm -hmm. um, and on the, on the right side of, of the ball fields, there's also a, a nature trail um, right through the place that should also be the, the park around the ball field should also be accessible uh, to make a loop. Mm -hmm. um, just a thought, but um, we don't have formal numbers yet. It's a matching grant, but in talking with Bill Wilker formally, we're thinking this project would be thirty to forty thousand uh, dollars. We would propose to. Um, it's a fairly wet area, so we need to do a little bit of work to get a base there. Couldn't just go over the grass. Um, it's a matching grant. The applications are due in early September, and it's only about five weeks out to apply that you learn if you're funded or not. So, our thought would be we would uh, firm up the numbers internally, apply for the grant, and then if awarded, we could incorporate that into the 2024 budget. Okay. Up to a certain level? Yep, up to what we think it'll cost. Okay. So if we can get the grant to pay for half of it, we'd be pretty thrilled. Do you have 900,000 here? You're, okay. But that's the total amount of funding, that's right? Total amount of funding, yeah. So you're not going to apply for that? No, there's not a limit. Um, and with the prior year awards, there's some larger project costs, and the board sometimes approves a lot and sometimes a little. Mm -hmm. um, so we would apply for the maximum we could, which is half of project cost. Okay. Uh, there's also some some discussion about um, EADA improvements to the uh, the playground, but I don't really fundamentally understand what that is in the ground or whether yet we have not kind of delve into that. We might see to incorporate a little bit of that or uh -huh. budget for it. Has NC group looked into that at all there? Um not beyond the study. Mm -hmm. okay. Which doesn't give us a lot of specificity in that particular issue. Right. I have a motion. Uh, I move to implement the permission to apply for this grant. I'm not probably the building general for uh, the building communities grant. Mm -hmm. Second motion. All right, so we'll moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If anyone wants to see the map, we'll leave it up on the table. I'm just saying out loud that this uh, ADA accessible path circles the baseball field to soccer field behind the state park basketball horseshoe pits. That's the portion of this park that we're talking about with this ADA trail. Um, that's all. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? You have permission to apply for the grant. Um, and perhaps some field users would like to write letters of support. I think you can submit up to me. Well, it's not due until September 12th. So yeah. Just okay. Next, we have a dog bite hearing. Right to a couple instances of uh, see a. Uh, Testimony from the 
um, normal control officer. She's on. She's online. Okay. Um, yeah, Ariel, if you could just follow up on that. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the audio quality kind of is a little in and out, so I'll do my best um, and nudge me if I miss well. anything that's said. Um, so there were two incidents. It's um, you know some neighbors that all live in a similar area, and it was two incidents with the same dog um, that bit two other dogs. So um, the two neighbors with those dogs did file a report, and um, you know I submitted. I think everybody from the select board should have had a chance to see the. Um, write up on the incident, is that correct? I did. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Um, I need yeah. verbal confirmation because I can't see any of you. So um, all right. <laughs> yes, um, perfect. Verbal confirmation. We've all read the reports. Um, you know, reading through things, um, you can kind of see what happens. The the first incident is, you know, an introduction that went awry between neighbor dogs. The second one was a gate that was left open. Um, you know, I believe that there's no such thing as a bad dog and that this dog just, you know, a um, couple different situations, things can get triggered by, uh, you know, territorial disputes or whatever. So I put in there, my recommendation is that, um, you know, uh, the owner has started to do fence reinforcements, things like that. I think those are great. I think those can, should the continue. Video back off. <laughs> Turn my video back off or, oh, yours. Okay. Um, yeah. So my suggestion is that the dog uh, in question just be muzzled when he's outside. It's, um, feels to me like a good compromise so that the dog can still enjoy his time outside. It's us. It's, us. it's not her. It's us. It's, no, it's us. Okay. I can turn yeah, off my. Uh... Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, so close. Okay. Tell me if I should do anything or not. Um, You're good, Ariel. Just keep okay. talking. <laughs> yeah, so I submitted my report. It's my recommendation that the dog be muzzled when outside, which is a good compromise to ensure that, um, you know, he should be supervised and contained in the fence or however other ways. Um, and then should something happen, like a gate be left open again, um, you know, if he gets out and he's muzzled, there there can't be any further um, incidents. It would just be, you know, a loose dog that can be caught. So that is um, kind of my suggestion in talking through the incidents and I've talked to, you know, everyone on either side. Um, and I think it's just, you know, a little neighbor to neighbor dog dispute um, and happy to answer any questions or provide additional information. There were some photos and some other documentation that was submitted that um, you should have seen, but I can also share if not. Well, they saw photos, they don't want you to share them. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Do that. Yeah. Um, Ariel, I had one question. Um, I was wondering if a, uh, a runner would be uh, as effective as a muzzle. Um, yeah, I have had my dog get attacked by a dog that was on a runner and one runner, one end of the runner came undone um, and the dog was essentially unleashed <laughs> as the end game. So um, Personally, I would suggest that something like a muzzle is just like a, a backup plan in case, for example, the gate is left open. Um, Amy sent along pictures uh, that I'm not sure if those have been passed around or not of fence reinforcements. And it's now, I think it's a six foot stockade fence. Amy is in person and could share more information. But in my mind, you know, a six foot stockade fence is going to contain pretty much all dogs. And it's just on the off chance that, you know, a gate is a jar or things like that. And those pictures I didn't have to circulate, so. Okay, uh, they yeah. were. Do you want they to were in an, yeah, they were in an email from Tom that, um, or an email from Amy that I forwarded to Tom that maybe they just didn't get the hassle on. It's a six foot fence. I can share pictures of it. Um, Amy is there and can probably show you the pictures on her phone too. Um, any other questions? Yeah, my uh, question Danny. is just really the process because a couple of different things, uh, including the flood, have happened since the last time we talked about this. So my question is what the um, what the need is from the select board tonight. Um, are we listening and approving the requirements? Is that what the, the goal is? Or like, or what what what's the ask from us before I know what questions to ask? Yeah, yeah. So the. <laughs> 
Um, the way that the ordinance is written, essentially, I don't have any um, enforcement power along these lines in town. I can just kind of mediate conflicts neighbor to neighbor and, you know, um, the victims have a right to request a hearing and within seven days, which then things did get pushed back with the flood. So we're a little over the seven days, um, but we did get that to get the request for the hearing from the victims. We yeah, so she, she can't do yeah, it. I can, I can, so there's a story. Yeah. Ariel, your audio is not, we're, we, not good enough. Uh, we're going to ask Tom to clarify. There's a okay. statute which gives the select board very broad powers, uh, and there's your local ordinance, and your local ordinance uh, allows the victim, uh, the victim to uh, request a hearing. So the, it's victim centered, which I think is appropriate. And so, really, what you're charged with here under the law is ensuring public safety and taking whatever steps you deem necessary. So again, under the ordinance, your your powers are um, broad to the point where you could you could order the to be terminated. And if I could just interject. Um, my thought was that we would take testimony uh, during the uh, public session and then have time to deliberate during the executive session and uh, come up with a statement. Go ahead. So my questions, I might lay out a couple uh, in a row just so they can be answered together and kind of go together. Is, is Chester muscle, muzzle trained already? And in the writing, we have muzzled and or restrained at all times because um, muzzle training can take weeks at minimum months and the doggy squats outside. So if he's not trained, then the or restrained would mean on a leash held by a human, which is a good option. Mm -hmm. So I just want to clarify that that and or is good. And also so that we all understand muzzle training can take months. You don't just put a muzzle on a dog. It can super traumatize them. Um, so I don't know whether he's trained or not. So I just want to go over that with all of us in particular. Okay. And the dog owner is here. We want to ask her to yeah. come up. <laughs> hey. Oh, I sit down. Please. Name and address for the record. <laughs> Amy Sharp, 39 Square Street. Uh, and I just first is, I guess, what I'm also not sure is whether. The recommendations were told to you and agreed upon. No. Okay. So that so the recommendation that we see is that Chester be muzzled and or restrained at all times when outside. It's said in depth, like there's no time limit, like for a year or what happened, or like until we evaluate. <laughs> so I'm curious if Chester, Chester is muzzled trained and or like the next steps. No, he's not muscle trained. And I'm curious if you all got my write up that they asked me to send it into. I, I don't think so. And we apologize, Amy. It's just been crazy here last week. So if you send it to Tom. Crazy too. Yeah, I, I think I had an awareness that you sent something, but I just didn't follow up to, to get it. So if you maybe you can that. just restate that if we've got it. Sure. The overall thing that happened, the, the quote first incident was with. Um, so my house has a stockade fence, a six foot stockade. So no, no holes. like no holes was three quarters of my yard. And then I had like a, a yellow, I mean, a white kind of like a, a gate with, a, I mean, a fence with the gate and the front side of my house, which is not there anymore. But um, so my, my backyard, our, my gate, is adjacent to another backyard that has Tracy and her sweet little dog Marty, and they would the dogs would nose at the gate and get riled up sometimes, ignore each other sometimes, and bark up. And then uh, Tracy's sister Kim lives around the corner with a sweet little dog Buck, and the dogs would get after each other at the fence. So the the day of the bite, we were talking through the fence, and I was talking about how when I see Chester with a dog park or whatever, he's very submissive. So we're getting the dogs to know each other, maybe they wouldn't bark, et cetera. So we said, well, we could try it. And um, I brought Chester into Tracy's yard, which is owned by Jordan and Joe, she's a tenant for Tracy, Tracy's a tenant. And we talked about, you know, sometimes dogs unleashed and all the dogs are dogs, they'll figure it out. But when we opened the fence up, both Buck and Chester were like, what? And Chester's bigger 
We pulled them apart, Chester off a of buck, but by that time, Chester had bit Buck's shoulder. And that was really sad and scary. So my partner, Mike, took Chester away. I went in with Tracy and Kim and Buck into Tracy's apartment to get a cold cloth and water while Tracy called the vet. And we said, we gotta take him to the vet. Kim, take him to the vet. Do you need my credit card? And she said, no, she's had one. And then I shared my number with Tracy, Tracy shared with Kim's, and then we texted through the day and evening about how it was, what can I do? Um, he stayed the night. I, of course, paid for the vet bill. And that day I also called the dog trainer, um, recommended by my vet, Emily Crawford. Um, but so what could have been dogs meeting and going, okay, didn't okay, it wasn't okay. And um, I had introduced Chester to another dog since until he's ready. But that was scary and an unfortunate event and was really crappy. Um, sorry for the minutes. But uh, I also feel the second thing that happened, thank you, with Buddy was that is Jordan Carroll's sweet dog too. They have the sweetest, happiest dog buddy who um, lives on Locust Terrace, which is, I believe that's their road. That's an easement through my property to the backyards. Um, so they always, George walks buddy several times a day and we always love to see them. And the day before, this was a couple of weeks ago, my son had friends over in the backyard. They were playing, they went to get a ball. They didn't shut the gate. So Chester saw George and Buddy barked and, and knocked and the gate was ajar and he went out and he messed with Buddy. Mike came out of the house, yelled at Chester and Chester booked it back to Mike, but he had bit Buddy's ear. So I was at work, my partner Mike came and told me what happened. He, well, first he checked in with Chester, or excuse me, with George and Buddy and a vet tech happened to be there. So she checked Buddy over and found the bite on his ear. Um, and George said he was going to go back and clean it up and check in and Mike, my partner, let him know if he has to go to the vet, we've got you, like whatever needs happen. So later that night, Mike went back over because I was still at work at ProPig and um, the, the synopsis from there was that his ear seemed to be okay, but they were going to keep ointment on it and see what happened. So we checked in with him over the next couple of days cried and apologized and we ripped down that fence that had the gate and put up a continue to stockade fence and that's the pictures that I have there. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is after this happened with Kim and my Tracy's yard is I put a we went to the hardware store that day and we got um, steaks and chicken wire to put like a two foot buffer so the dogs couldn't nose up to the fence and get each other going. So that two foot buffer now is around my whole yard as well. Um, so we have a little bit of an Alcatraz going on. And yeah, Chester has not been on walks with me and we are outside in the backyard um, with them. That's where they spend the time in the big fence in area or they spend the time inside. We have a latch gate, like one of those swing shut baby gates next to our driveway, but that's not where anything has happened anyway. And we've put, um, there's chicken wire around my porch too. Not that he could squeeze from it because it's only like this far, but that way the dogs, he or Bentley, my little dog, don't have their faces through it. Bark can't make them, he still barks, but um, yeah, and he's enrolled. We have him enrolled in dog school. So we are working with the dog trainer um, and really working on triggers and keeping him in and, you know, like I said, unfortunately, it didn't go well uh, introducing him to Buck, but all the other stinking dogs that we've been to dog parks with and played with, he's been on his back. So that's why we were like, okay. And like my text to Cam, which I have here also include, like I would never, ever suggested that it would have been okay. Uh, where she said, I know, you know, <coughs> it went bad and it was troublesome. But thank you for your help and your attendance. And I know basically I know you care about her. So, so for that, we've tried to mitigate the problem by taking the gateway that I got out of um, and put up the six foot fence. 
and then another group of plants inside so that the dogs don't mess with each other. And it's going to doggy school. Um, yeah, any questions from the board? Yes. Hi, my name's Jordan. I own the property that this has happened on. Okay. Um, but, uh, if you could come forward, too. Uh, um, so I hate to say fortunately, and I'm sorry to take everyone's time. We've got higher priorities. However, safety on my property is one of my highest. Um, I am a property owner. I have a tenant. Um, I rent saying it's a pet friendly place. Um, I abut your property. Your dogs do bark. I do also spend a good deal of time in my backyard and I get growled at through the fence. And this has happened in the last year since I've moved there. Um, you have fixed part of the fence. However, the other side where you said nothing has happened yet, but nothing happened until something happens. Um, but the gate to the porch is about three feet tall. Um, and then that white fence also has a kennel door. It looks like it's kind of broken and there's a kind of kennel door just sitting up against it. It's, you can't get out of that. That's why. You okay, I that. hear you. But the dogs aren't, they don't have a collar on. So if they got out of the yard, God forbid, no one has identification as to who this dog is and who owns it. They are outside without your supervision. So I would be most comfortable with us considering a dog, with us considering having children, with me considering renting to other people on this property. I would feel much more comfortable until proven otherwise with this dog, that there's much more secure uh, things in place that are uh, obviously we've escalated to this bit because I want security. And I'd be happy. I've, one other thing that is dismayed to me is that, that my neighbors in here and then come to you first either. So we tried they to say, mediate. Look. We did. <laughs> I'm trying to for just a second to ask because I'm unsure of process and I'm a little uncomfortable. I just want to make sure. Like, <coughs> do we speak to them? Do they speak to each other? I just want the process. Yeah. I just want to check and see. Yeah. I, I you're, don't know. yeah. you're addressing us. Sure. Yeah. So sorry. Um, I would like a greater assurance that this doesn't ever happen again two strikes and I feel like that they happened in a matter of a few weeks. I will, you know, I don't believe any dog is a bad dog, but I believe we as owners have the responsibility to take action and be proactive um, and understand the potential that an animal has. Mm -hmm. um, I worked one-on-one -on -one with a trainer with my dog. I've been a farmer for years. I believe that there's much more that we have the responsibility with our livestock or animals that we need to really ensure. I believe that a gate seems high and tall, but that's until, of course, it's jumped. Um, I had a husky jump a seven-foot fence to have a shindig with a neighbor's dog, and we had nine puppies out of it. So we didn't know that could happen until it happened, and I just, um, we've seen the impossible happen more than once this week. So uh, what restraints would you feel comfortable with? I will want to think the dog should be identifiable should it get out so it needs a collar even if it's in the yard we've proven that the dog can get out um and two i do believe that a muzzle if it's going to be a chance um that or the owner needs to be outside any second that the dog is outside the dog will run it'll be fast and before you know it it's an old man walking a dog who could have gotten knocked over I don't feel comfortable renting a property and not telling people about what's going on in the neighborhood, and that hinders me as a property owner and a renter. Okay. Um, thanks, Jordan. Appreciate it. Anything? Any other questions from the board for Jordan? No. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Do you want everybody up here? Uh, yeah, actually, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Appreciate your testimony. My mm -hmm. name is Kim Huff. Um, I live on Railroad Street. My sister is Jordan's tenant who lives her property above us, Amy's property, and I had my dog buck there. He was the dog that was attacked. Yeah. I just want to know that Amy was very good when my dog got attacked. She was very compassionate. She didn't pay the bill. She was very good about it, and that's why. I made no complaints at that time because I felt like steps were being taken. She it certainly was not intentional by any means. She certainly didn't bring her dog over and go, God, I hope it attacked your dog and hurt some of that. That was not her intention. 
Um, however, after the second one, made me really nervous because not only did they attack my uncle's dog, but my uncle was in his 80s, is could be unsteady on his feet. This he is George. Have, yep, he could have knocked him over, he could have hurt him. And it's called an accident. Accidents can happen more than once. If the gate got left open once, what's to say that gate's not going to get left open again? And that dog's going to get out. It's an accident. Accidents happen more than once. Mm -hmm. My concern is that, yes, the gate will get left, o left open. And that is a path which many children travel to school. Many people walk their dogs. People walk children in strollers with dogs. What if that dog were to attack a dog while someone is pushing a stroller or a baby in the stroller? There's so many scenarios that could go so badly. And it would not be her intention. I know that that's not who Amy is at all. As a person, I don't believe. But I do believe that just fixing a fence is not going to solve this problem because, like I said, an accident is an accident, and accidents can happen more than once. So that gate, kids could become a replacement. It might not even be your own kids, but somebody else leaves and leaves it open. Yeah. So I just feel like there needs to be more than a fence in this situation for everyone's safety and god forbid it had been my dog that he had got a second time because i walked my dog by there too and if it had been my dog i wouldn't be at this meeting right now i'd probably be in jail <laughs> <laughs> well that's an honest fact <laughs> thank, thank goodness for that but... yeah that's like my child <laughs> questions from the board yes Alyssa. I would love to hear from Ariel just if there's any other options you consider Thanks, prior to this recommendation. Yeah, I mean, I think um, all of those recommendations that have kind of been discussed make sense. I um, wasn't really aware that the dogs are out in the yard without a collar. And I think that's an easy fix is just put on some identification when they're outside. And I agree, um, having a person to supervise, continue with training and um, work on muzzle training so that, you know, that way you could get out to walk the dog out in the community once again. And that, um, you know, I would hope that the dog can be trained and get back to that point. I think um, you're working with the trainer, or Amy is working with the trainer, which is fantastic. And I think um, just continuing to take those steps and make sure that the dog gets socialized and, um, you know, hopefully we can reevaluate and in time, uh, you know, these things won't be necessary, but, um, until then, I think just some identification, restraint, and working towards, um, yeah, ensuring that the dog, that no accidents can happen and, you know, making sure that fences and things like that are maintained as secure. Uh, do you have a recommendation in terms of how much time it would take before we uh, reevaluated? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I don't know. I don't know exactly like what the timeline is. I mean, I think all dogs have different timelines with training. Um, but uh, I think someone said like six months to at least reevaluate if that makes sense or um, I'm not sure if others feel differently. I don't have a great recommendation on a timeline, unfortunately. You have no requirement to reevaluate your decision to make time. Yeah, but we may want to. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so along Roger's question, Ariel, I'm wondering, I know that we're, there's a lot going on. So time-wise, this might be a, a heavy lift that you don't have time for right this, this week. But thinking about if there are resources to look back, like in other cases, I don't know if this is a thing. I don't know, like, but can we look at other cases and say that they've been reevaluated in six months, nine months, a year, or what have you, just to kind of see what maybe precedent there is? to help guide us on that? Um, I don't have, um, yeah. I mean, I can try and look like beyond the Waterbury community. I don't have access to any past um, Waterbury dog cases. It, Karen, maybe maybe you do, um, and we could look at that. But yeah. I think Carly yeah. said she had three. Okay. It was the town clerk. Okay. How many years? Yeah. Um, yeah, there isn't a lot of precedence in this town, it seems right. like, for these, so. I, think I have enough information. Anyone else feel like we need any more information on this? I, I did want to ask, if I may, please, uh, Amy, how old is Chester? Like a year and a half. It's a year and a half old. Now I have all the information. <laughs> okay. And just to add, the gate in question is gone. The gate that was a yard is ripped out and gone, and that's the six foot fence now. So, is there a gate to open and close from the from your can you get into your six foot fence from anywhere except from before the house? No. Okay. 
You can't get it anywhere. Mm -hmm. There's the porch. That's from my house. So I'm asking mm -hmm. if you are, porch, if, I, if I don't open your front door, I can't get in that. My side door on my driveway is where we enter the my deck and the back. You step up three steps on the deck and you walk off the deck into the fenced in yard. And there's a three foot gate. And then there's a side broken, another white picket fence. There's two other access points that are not six foot fences that are not private into the home. This is not accurate. Okay. What she's saying. So I don't have a photo. So I'm going to end the, that conversation because I don't feel like I know the answer without seeing it. Uh, Mike. Hey, just to refresh my memory, I know we said, uh, what's the breed of the dog? He's a, just a mixed little mutt breed. I think that he has some black mouth curd in the south. Okay. I'm so not so really I'll sure what he is, no. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. And I also, um, an idea could also be is, um, uh, having like having the dog trainer have reports or something that I can share with you all about where we're at. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but who is it that you're referencing? Caitlin Bennett. I'm still. Any other questions concerning this um, dog bite issue? It looks like Tom Gore has a question. Tom. Hi, this is Zachary Show. Signed in here as well. Go ahead, we can hear, can't hear you very particularly well, just to let you know. So, does the fence go all the way three, six, around your yard, Amy? That six foot fence. Uh, yeah. Uh, it goes, yeah. It goes okay. all the way around the yard, and then we have a rock wall and hedges. And after bushes and a bunch of junk in the yard. And then it goes around the side where there's some picket gates, but the gate can't open because it's broken. And then we re we put metal and stuff on the outside of that too as reinforcement for the gate. That gate can't open. You have to just go next to my porch. Cheryl, if you don't mind, can you use the chat box and I'll read your note because the audio is impossible. Sorry. A question. It's not your fault. <laughs> yeah, Tom. Um, Amy? Yeah. Uh, how much does your dog weigh? About 50 pounds. Okay. What's this? <laughs> it's not me this time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Cheryl. Yeah, Cheryl. I I don't know if you had a question. I apologize. We're just having a lot of trouble hearing you. You can give it one more try if you'd like. And Cheryl sure got standing in this issue. Uh, she's not a neighboring property. She she probably uses Stowe Street, perhaps on foot. Just just one. No. Oh, here we go. Just making sure because the property also adjoins my parents. Oh, okay. Yeah, her parents live right behind yeah. us. Or like up the side of us near Ingrid. All right. Yeah. I just want to make sure I should. Her involvement. Does she have a particular question? Um, thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think everyone feel like we've got enough information on this to deliberate uh, at the end of the meeting. Okay, thank you very much. I understand this is a difficult issue for everyone involved, and uh, you know, we'll try to make the best decision we can to ensure the safety of everyone in the community. Um, MOU with Rotary. Oh, Cheryl had a question about the fence height. Six feet. Cheryl is the fence height, and it still remains a little unclear if it goes all the way around the house. Oh, Mike has a question. Yes, Mike. 
Uh, Roger, I just need to um, disclose that I need to abstain from this discussion because I am a Rotarian. So I, I could answer any questions. I'm not sure you do, but I really don't think you do. Um, mm -hmm. You can be a member organization and vote from the select board. You're not, you're not receiving any, any benefit. You're not receiving any money from being a Rotarian. In fact, it's the opposite. You're, you're doing work. And, and you're be dying, so you, you can recuse yourself, certainly, if it makes you uncomfortable, but I don't think you have any requirement to recuse yourself. Okay. Or obligation. And I would actually welcome your participation if you choose not to vote on uh, the final resolution. I, I, I would be glad to participate because I know a lot about the relationship. As a matter of fact, I'm on the Parks Committee for the Rotary. So, you're so important, uh, but I'd probably be less. because of my knowledge and, you know, <laughs> I would mm -hmm. probably abstain from voting. Yeah. All right. Uh, would you mind introducing uh, yes. our guests? I'm Al Lewis, I am a Rotary Chairman of the Park Committee, and what I'm doing is bringing before you a memorandum of understanding that our board has approved. Um, we spent quite a bit of time going over the details, the assignments, and uh, essentially, well, before I do this, one of Peters, former president of our board, who's involved in the the discussions and Mario is our present president. So we've got two officials here as well as myself on the park committee. Um, so before I begin, what I want to do is go back just briefly. On the back page, it says attached A. 40 years ago, in 1983, a Rotary Club uh, made a commitment to the Village of Waterbury when the park was built. And uh, what's identified here on that page are most of the things that our Rotary Club financed and provided the manpower and uh, to build right from the beginning. So many of you might not have been around back in years ago and uh, don't know anything about the origin of the park but uh, a rotary club dedicated that and a member of the rusty park which was a long time not just to serve uh simply serving to the community but also uh, to the attorney the secretary and the attorney. he passed away on the air uh along with the broadcast and the broadcast and uh, so our club dedicated it when we dedicated the park, we also created a cultural arts program and we raised funds in order to start seeding that cultural arts program. So we can uh, basically uh, hold the responsibility of giving the community concerts every year, year after year, free stuff in the park. And that's grown from what I passed around there was the first, the first concert that we had. But it was, uh, on the 23rd of May, uh, 1983, and the rest of the program for that particular first season. Um, it's since grown to as many as 13 concerts during the season. Right now, this year we have 10 concerts. So I just want to go back. The history is a Rotary Club made a commitment back then, and we decided that we did not want to bury the boat with the responsibility of creating something which would in the long term, be a maintenance issue. So our club members throughout the years have been in the park. Um, in cooperation with the village and EFUD, we had our things taken care of, which are listed basically as the town responsibilities now since the town is the park. Um, but we felt it would be appropriate to, since EFUD no longer exists for, as far as the park is concerned. The village ended no longer exists. And EFUD, uh, and the representatives, three of the representatives of EFUD, we dealt with, with the village all the time. So we had a long term relationship with them. Um, we wanted to make sure that we started off on the right track with, with the town. And so what this memorandum is, it's a paper copy of a handshake. It's not a legal document, um, but it's saying to you, the town, that we would like to continue the relationship we had 
in the past with the uh, village mm -hmm. for many, many years, and then the most recent years, Ipa. And, uh, and with that, we've, we've identified also things that the town has done for us at down the the park, you know, with not just us, but the full uh, the community. And uh, by doing that, um, it sort of sets out the responsibilities so that if, if we see some work going on down the park and it's not part of the stuff that we're supposed to do here, it really questions what's going on. If the town sees something going on down at the park, so it also questions. So we come to us and say, what are you guys doing? Um, <laughs> over the years, we've done some, some uh, maintenance and some upgrading. We replaced the gazebo around. Uh, Henry Shepard, under his, uh, he was president of the club. Uh, so, <laughs> Harry, Harry dedicated his president's project to basically upgrading the reverse from some of the stuff that we had in the park. Mm -hmm. he's, he's kind of close to ten thousand dollars was it a year? But it was quite a sum of money that we could raise from uh one of the uh, NQIDs that we had down at Forest Field. And uh, so anyway we replaced the gazebo railings with code compliant railings. Mm -hmm. The old ones that we had uh were out of code and most of them were falling apart. We upgraded the LED we upgraded to LED the lamp posts that are there, the four lamp posts, installed fencing around the gardens, uh, replaced the canopy ones. Um, <coughs> that was about a seven thousand dollar uh, item. Yeah, to replace the canopy. Uh, installed street lights on the Rotary Way side, which is the which is the railroad station side. Those two yeah. street lights, Rotary was involved in the paid for. Um, the maple trees, we had the canopy cut up so that uh, you could see the railroad station better from South Main Street. That was a major undertaking as far as uh, basically uh, an arborist in order to properly cut those branches and make sure they were still going to maintain the beauty of the canopy. And we cabled a lot of those uh, trunks so that they don't split off because those type of maple trees have a tendency to split. So there are cables up there and some of those cables oh. and then we cut them down. Yeah. And uh, I think, well, th th that's just some of the things. Yeah. Anyway, so what I'm here today uh, is to bring to you the MOU that we came up with. Uh, Tom's had a chance to be here. Uh, Lena was chairman of the board, president of the town, and the board passed this. Mm -hmm. And basically, we're asking you to join with us in this handshake. And continue for as long as we can, understanding that uh, you know on either side there may be some changes, there may be some things that fall apart that uh, happen. That, you know, yeah. for example, if for some reason uh, we can't get to equipment uh, the canopy, we know it's going to cost four hundred fifty dollars to put it in this place. Yeah, you, know, you can't take it down and it's a to change. So what we say is four hundred fifty dollars each time is something that. That we feel good about in being able to provide some close and economic service to the community. Hopefully, we will continue that. As far as concerts in the park is concerned, we used to have concerts with uh, serving ice cream. We partnered with Ben and Jerry's and serving what they call Fred's ice cream, which is the big boxes of seconds that we had up until I think four years ago, maybe, um, when the relationship with Ben and Jerry's fell apart. Did not get those ice cream uh, contributions anymore. But up until that time, all those years we served ice cream, three or four ice cream. Mm -hmm. and then those, there was lottery numbers that people served in. Okay. Uh, so, I remember well. Anyway, uh, I guess I'm going to ask if you have any questions. I uh, was here. Glenn uh, mm -hmm. is here. <laughs> and I'm passing around a slightly revised version that Al just gave to me a few minutes ago. Okay. And the uh, the comment I had over email with Al was the first one was the money where his MOU uh, gave a limit of five thousand dollars, and I suggested that that might change over time. So let's just add more flexible language. Uh, so it doesn't say. Uh, it does it? It isn't limited to five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars. That wants to spend more money. The town has the option. Spending more money, mm -hmm. and then yeah, I just need to. Oh, I have um, 
No, this is not to exceed. It's in town it's in town it says uh, up to five thousand or greater amount if agreed upon. On the rotor, on the rotor, it says not August yet, so I just want you to see that because you likely want to change that. Yeah, no, that's been changed. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know. No, no, Danny's correct. Danny's correct. On the first page, it says. Oh, that part was. It says on the front. Well, our intention was not to exceed five thousand without bringing to the town's attention that we needed money for something major like the town. When we did this with the village, we actually split the cost. We did it for the land post, upgrade the land post. We split the cost. So it wasn't hundred percent building or hundred percent building. It was a shared responsibility. But we didn't. We didn't go ahead and do it and then send it back. Mm -hmm. right. right. So the maintenance is routine maintenance. We're talking about spray paint painting. Uh, Warning, we don't like corny, let's call so that. Or, the light bulbs, but the LEDs should last a long time. Well, the gray hair is showing in our yeah. talk right now. And, and mm -hmm. uh, so we've got some things that some of our members in a couple of years are going to be able to do. And so, so, so section 13 should read. He said not to exceed five thousand dollars, but up to five thousand dollars or a greater amount if agreed upon by the town. And then it's the other language in section 19, I think we're fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, if, if, you, if you look at the, the last page, it, it talks about the town of Rotary may terminate this agreement uh, if the town of understanding or presents it to the agreement. It, it's, it can be changed at any time. By the town or the voter. By, by either, no. by, by either by party. Either party. Right. Yeah, they, they the 60 days notice. Okay. And then the, the only other change that was proposed in the draft version that was sent out was um, item 20 under town responsibility was added. That was not there before. Uh, and that's just that something that. We do now, so I thought let's just memorialize it. Mm -hmm. um, Which is managing uh, event reservation requests yeah. and approval and posting of approved events That's the way it's on town property. Right yeah. So and, uh, as I understand it, you're basically codifying the agreement, the handshake agreement that you had with EFUD and the village before them uh, for several years. Uh, Tom's assessment is that uh, you've been saving the town twenty to thirty thousand dollars every year, and service to the community, particularly <coughs> at Buster Parker Park, not to mention all the facilities for for the community. And let me just be clear that twenty to thirty thousand is it's just the maintenance they what they do at the park. Never mind the fundraising they do to pay for things like the bands. Mm -hmm. So it's really a lot more in totality. It's, it's a big impact. All right, Mike. Our I'm, I'm sorry. Happy to do that. It's, it's it's a service project, something that has been within our capability. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, frankly, going back to the original commitment, we did not want to burden community management for the municipality and having to take care of these facilities. Uh, I experienced over many many towns across the state when I was working as a state employee was that. Uh, recreation facilities, rec uh, things such as this, got the last attention sometimes when it came to budgetary and maintenance. And we wanted to make sure that that, that wasn't an issue here. It wasn't a concern. So that's one of the reasons why we took this up. We we'll certainly appreciate everything that we've done over the many years and we continue to do. Uh, Mike. Especially um, being a Rotarian and being on the Parks Committee, I know there was a lot of consternation about. The MOU. I really encourage the MOU by Rotary because I think it's really important that relationships are kind of spelled out. And I think one of the concerns was should Rotary, as Al said, a lot of the Rotarians are getting older, can we continue to do this? That's one of the reasons why you know they want to have a provision, you know, not that they they're going to go away from doing this, but you know, there may be a point in time that Rotary just doesn't have the ability to help in the park. But I think in the interim, this is a really good document that forges our relationship. And I think it's really, I think it's important that it's, that it's there. And it's not something to say, oh, you're going to do this. This is just, you know, kind of trying to spell out some ideas. Uh, 
you know, responsibilities. And I think it's a real forward step. I think it's good for Rotary. I think it's good for me. Well, Mike, thank you for your leadership on this. That was uh, Glenn and Al and Ariel. Uh, Alyssa. I would move to approve the memorandum of understanding between the Rotary Club of Waterbury and Town of Waterbury regarding Rusty Parker Park with thanks to the Rotary Club for their over 40 years of management and service to the community and authorize the municipal manager to sign the agreement. Very As good. revised. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so the All right. I was doing so good. Karen, are we good? Mm -hmm. Second. All right, okay. we have a uh, motion has been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Aye. Aye. Okay, we have one abstention. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask a very quick question. Um, I'm oh, going to first announce the, the motion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> I'm very Sorry, I'm so tired. Thank you for your patience with me literally today. Um, Karen, do you take your patients to the park or does that go to the rec department? Um, actually, there's many of us in the office right now that can do reservations oh. for the park through the MyRec website. Oh. So when it was a village park, it, it had that extra layer of yeah. checking with EFED, but now it just seems like we reveal and we say, oh, you want to use the park? Use the park. Okay. <laughs> well, but when you, did, when you discuss schedule of fees next month, if that happens, um, that park specifically doesn't have a fee attached to it. And that should be looked at. Okay. It, it should be treated like all the other parks, That's in my opinion. Noted somewhere for... to, um, just a question. I'll get to you, Karen, in a second. Do you have any uh, issue with that? Uh, that we might charge a fee as we do in every other park? No, we would just ask that you would waive it for our concert. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's a fair. That's a fair <laughs> enough ask. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were on the right track. Come on. <laughs> Okay. My question were, were any of you at the July 31st concert with Banjo Dan? Does it sound as good as it's written? I literally also can't wait to tell everyone I know about Banjo Dan and the Midnight Plowboys. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have? They're, uh, yes, I've seen really. Been, I've seen them several times. I have. Are they awesome? Yeah. <laughs> we'll see if we can get a brand new idea. Yes. <laughs> I have a video that we're going to put online uh, on our Rotary website that is a video that Conti, Andy Conti made uh -huh. of that event. Okay. And, and also that year, Waterbury was designated as the cleanup city for Vermont. Oh, wow. So prior wow. to that event, even before we had Stanton, the Trump oh, and uh, Governor Snelling had come to Waterbury as a helicopter. Yeah. Had a parade down Main Street, and they had a big ceremony there with him. And it's all on all on film. <laughs> and everybody that has played there now can see what they look like back then. <laughs> and the kids, you know, they can identify. I'm going to tell my kids over there. Anyway, so that's going to go online as soon as we can get rid of it. But I'd like to add just two more things. Sure. Um, when we when we establish a sign up for the use of the park. Uh, one of the things that we did was develop a protocol for signing up, which basically made a commitment that any individual who represented the group would give their name, their contact information, and what what that project, what that event is about. Mm -hmm. um, the village trustees used to review that because there were occasions where there were events that were not appropriate necessarily, and they wanted to to weigh in on it. And, uh, and that would be the case, not just for us, but for anybody. Um, but having that sheet that they have to sign with an authorized representative would mean one thing. You leave the park the way you found it. Mm -hmm. Our park has been trying to keep it clean. Even after some of the events that we're not involved in, our Rotary members were passing by to go out there and pick up stuff and whatnot. Uh, same thing with the restrooms. So, um, if, if they're obligated to leave it the way they found it, uh, that would go a long ways for us and a long ways for the town and the ratio. Yeah. What was the full recommendation? So uh, I, I hope that that's what this means. And I gave, Tom, I gave you earlier uh, a copy of a set of rules that we, the village had passed the rules for the use of the park. Um, we upgraded those based on 
some minor changes that we've had over the years or incidents that we've had over the years. But we do need some signs in that park uh, identifying the rules. And Rusty Park, the park is different than that road, and different than the park. So there are certain things in those rules. Something very simple, like throwing objects around, for example, or riding bikes in the event. Um, it, it really are important for safety and also uh, maintenance uh, prevention because we've had globes broken because people are firing, basically kids firing footballs in the park back and forth. That's something going to happen. And it's not going to break. But that's a $500 item if you break it. So, anyway, little things like that that. Really I'll talk to my son. Then. I think noise, <laughs> noise in that part. Uh -huh. Do you have uh, uh, recommended rules uh, that you could? Uh, I've given them to Tom. Uh, Tom has already. Okay, good. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, care ordinance. So there's, um, since the last meeting, this was advertised in front porch forum. Mm -hmm. uh, we did get uh, one comment, and uh, part of it was there was a correction. There was there was one place in the first document where uh, we still referred to the tree committee instead of the tree board. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. um, and the second the second part of the comment was uh, simply that the person questioned the size of the board and wondered how we arrived at seven. Mm -hmm. um, I think seven is a workable number. Not even consistent with other committees or boards necessarily. So I didn't see the need to recommend any change there. Mm -hmm. um, did they have a, another number that they preferred? They did not. They were just wondering why we got to seven. Seven's a great number. <laughs> um, um, but otherwise, there's, there's no other changes from, from the prior meeting. So if the select board was interested in the tree ordinance, you could adopt it tonight and then the, the legal process would begin to post it, advertise it, and, and wait to see if there's any sort of uh, central appeal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, as I remember from our last meeting, which feels like a million years ago after this week, um, there was a ton of work put into this ordinance, right? Like, and it's been drafted and redrafted. I think the committee worked on this for probably close to a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there were only two comments, which means that the public has had time to view it. It seems good. We're going to have to do another draft. Uh, yeah. Uh, Gary. So I, I just have a question. I don't want to be snarky. Mm -hmm. um, Does he want to come up here? Gary, do you want to come up? Or? Yeah. yeah. You want, you, He's been up here yeah. for like. Yes, see, you'll you'll see much less snarky if you're at the table. No, no, no. <laughs> all the donuts that we had, but well, we still have an apple pie though. Ooh, so, uh, uh, so my question really is: Is there any real enforcement? Because quite honestly, there's a lot of ordinances in Waterbury that aren't enforced. Um, mainly, a lot of parking ordinances that are not enforced <laughs> that are that do have an impact on public safety. So I'm one of those people that why have a rule if you're not going to enforce it at first. So I, I think this is important and I support it because my wife and I go out for walks when it's not raining and she's not working overtime at night and we have to dodge trees. So I think it's important to, to trim those, cut those, but if the, and the homeowners already know they're there. So is, the, is there an, it's a little bumpy. Late, but is there a mechanism to have the town go do it and then invoice the owners to recoup the cost of that labor? Yes, there is. So that's Perfect. specified in state law. It's not a part of this ordinance, but this doesn't mean it's negated by adopting this ordinance. Perfect. So it I, I Mike, our uh, rule enforcement officer. Yeah, tree. Mike is tree warden. Yeah. yeah. A tree warden is the enforcement officer, as I understand it. He's the, not exactly. So if there was, uh, mm -hmm. well, the tree warden is the tree warden. The tree warden wouldn't have the power to put a fine in place that would fall to the select board using the recommendation of the tree warden. Okay. That's it, really. I just, mm -hmm. 
when I get smacked in the face because I'm not paying attention where I'm walking. Uh, <laughs> it's and, and my wife doesn't it's shorter, but uh, it, it's frustrating that the the trees and the branches are literally in front of people's houses and they don't trim them. So mm -hmm. I don't think the town should do it without being recouping that cost. Right. And we are again, we already have ordinances that we don't enforce. And I, I'm just not a fan of passing ordinances just to pass them. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I have a question, just hanging yeah. again. Um, I read the graph uh, <laughs> because I have some questions with my own trees. Um, if this is accepted, is there somebody that is it the tree warden that I would call for advice? Because I'm like, I don't know if this is like a power company thing or. I don't know if this is a, I'm allowed to do this because it's on a town easement, but it's still kind of on my property. But I think the town owns this yeah, through tree, an easement for tree, tree, stuff. Warden, tree warden is the right person. Okay. Because I'd like to take some of the, I mean, like somebody to give me advice on how to do that safely, but there's some things that I think we aren't getting closer to. Gary, to Gary's issues. Yeah, definitely mm -hmm. not me yet, but Gary. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I just wanted to say that I'm Stuart Whitney. I'm a member of the tree committee. Mm -hmm. I wrote this ordinance. Um, so I'm here. <laughs> if, if there's anything I can answer. And if that was snarky, um, I, I, I want him to try better. Take care of this game. <laughs> uh, I think I think the state the state statutes are, are what we depend on to enforce the, the ordinance. Um, it's not the, the town doesn't necessarily have to you know decide what to do. They can just read the ordinances and, and the <clears throat> this tree care ordinance only has a partial of those ordinances mm -hmm. mentioned in it. There's a whole bunch that are have been left out for various reasons. But the select board and the tree warden are, are the go-to people. And and Jane Brown is um, up in the corner. She's the chair of the committee. King, uh, I just wanted to say how appreciative I am, I'm going to speak for myself here, that you wrote this so that we didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and it's I, I've read it. I've read the draft, and I, I I like its simplicity. I like it's like you know hazardous tree description. That's it. I love it. It's simple. Great job, Alyssa. And Tom, you reviewed. You don't have any concerns about maintenance in terms of the contract requirements, things like that. It is not. Yes. Is there anything, Stuart, in that ordinance that addresses low hanging ends or overall or down the road? Yeah. If, if, there, if there was in the, the, the right of way, um, we can get the town There's no way people at home can hear that. Or us. <laughs> What's a snow globe mic? If you wouldn't mind just addressing us, uh, sure. people up from the uh, Zoom world can't hear us. No, I'm just telling that uh, I've been trying to get the town's highway department to address the many, many limbs hanging along the roadside. They even put a double shop up here driving my big truck to the point that I have to stay in the middle of the road because. Mm -hmm. Smash windows or ripped off mirrors. It's you know the power company has done a lot of the work by turning back the power lines. But right. They're still too big to arrive someday. So it's actually hazardous. Okay. Who is our tree warden? Michael Mike Moshiabo. Michael Moshiabo. Yeah. Moshiabo. Moshiabo. It's on our yeah. website, Amy. Yeah. Yeah. I can spell it. I don't know. No, no one pronounces it quite the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I believe we also, we also um, 
and Jane knows this, we're, we're trying to get Celia from the highway um, department as the deputy tree warden to work in, in conjunction with us to um, get, help some of the Just issues that Chris is raising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I have a motion. He could get a smaller car. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Jane. I just want to say I want to thank Stuart because he put so much work in on this. Uh, Steve Law's speech also before he retired uh, was a big partner in this, and Steve was a co chair with me of the tree committee. Now I'm the chair of the tree committee. Uh, we don't want to have a statute just to have, I mean, a, um, an ordinance just to have an ordinance. We, we really um, worked closely with Urban Forestry Program for the state of Vermont. Um, and as you can see in there, according to state law <clears throat> that was in the last few years has come around to defining all of these responsibilities. Um, VSA is all listed in the ordinance. So, um, you know, we take it fairly seriously. We've been doing a number of the things that are, are in the in the list um, on here for responsibilities. Uh, we've been applying for grants. We've been, but there are some things we haven't really been doing. We haven't had an annual Arbor Day tree celebration, which would be kind of a fun thing. And we probably could do more to educate the community uh, we've applied for funds to do an emerald ash borer um, uh, plan, and that's referenced in here. Um, I think that we could do more to do uh, upgrade our shade tree inventory and to be more aware of um, maintenance and planning needs in the town, as well as where there are opportunities to do new tree planting. We this this um, this ordinance would kind of compel us to be as a tree committee, which would probably be renamed the tree board, which is what other towns have, is I think to be more organized and more um, responsible in these in these um, five areas or six areas, which I, I think would be a, a benefit to the town. So thank you. Thank you, Jen. Appreciate all your service on this. Uh, King. Uh, am I making a motion? Mm -hmm. I move to adopt the tree care ordinance as drafted. Second. All right. Motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Mike? Yep. Um, Jane and Stuart, do you have a full board of seven as, mm -hmm. as maintaining seven members been a problem? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, it's um, we do have seven members currently. Um, uh, and it is, it is, it's been problematic keeping people on the board. Uh, I mean, uh, so, but we don't have trouble getting new numbers, but it, it fluctuates from time to time. And, and it, at any given meeting or event that we hold, um, it's, it's rare that all seven members are able to attend. It's not, it's not onerous to have that many members. The only reason I asked that I know some other boards, especially larger boards, that they get a little challenged with, um, you know, quorums and stuff when they have, you know, have large numbers like that. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. If, you know, if you think that's an appropriate number, I'm not going to second guess the committee. We, we don't have any problem with that number. Okay. For <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The tree ordinance is passed. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Thank you very much. I think we'll be changing our name to the tree board. Or say, as a formality, do you want a motion to that effect or no? Yes, I, I would like that. Okay, so then, <laughs> as per the proposed Town of Waterbury Tree Care Ordinance, I move to rename the Waterbury Tree Committee, the Waterbury Tree Board, as I Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? 
It is now the Waterbury Tree Board. It's not, not like a little wordplay with board. Mm -hmm. tree board. <laughs> ah, that is good. Yes. Well, it's dimensional now. Uh, dimensional lumber. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Speaking uh, for the trees. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hopefully they've gotten enough water. Yes. We haven't had to worry about watering the trees this year. Thank no. you. Uh, the draft charter. And just before I do that, for the record, at the EFUD meeting immediately before this, the Zoom crashed a few times, lost its connection. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what's going on here. They've got fiber optic, it's screaming fast. We should be having issues. Yeah, I've been texting Bob to let him know that it's weak signal. That's it. And I'm on the town. It's so weird because we've been using it with like a hundred million laptops. But you guys are you guys are all you're attached to a different Wi-Fi network than I am. I shouldn't be having problems. I should be the only one on this network. So that's more alarming. <laughs> Tom, go ahead. Okay. On the charter, um, the, the intent from the select board, the, uh, the order was to keep it simple. And so that's mm -hmm. what I did. Since mm -hmm. there's been no push uh, or desire to separate the categories of taxes and the local option tax, it's one simple question that can go to the voters mm -hmm. um, on all three categories. Uh, the voters can say yes or no to so whether we cover the sales, run and meals, and alcohol beverages. Mm -hmm. You could separate those, but I don't think you should, quite frankly. I don't think they're all that separate and distinct anymore, uh, especially meals, drinks, and alcohol beverages, since meals and alcohol beverages so often go together. Mm -hmm. Is that why you did that? Uh, I did have a question about that because usually you have rooms and meals tax, and then there's a uh, tax on uh, alcoholic beverages. But you had. Uh, meals and alcoholic beverages uh, together and then rooms is a separate uh, issue but uh, i mean for me it's maybe just all running together uh, i'm gonna whip that blood <laughs> <laughs> the 600 is, is really firm uh, the number no the numbers were broken out correctly uh i thought uh but the just the way you had written it yeah, I see that. I see that now. Yeah. Okay. Um, Nothing. Nothing. Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, I will say that the proposed article for the for the local option tax is exactly what we requested. Um, short and sweet. Mm -hmm. And I'm all, again as appreciative as appreciative as I was for the for the tree ordinance being. Straight to the point. I really appreciate this grouping. Straight to the point. So uh, I agree. I mean, I think it's uh, well written, with the exception of that little thing I just pointed out. Um, <laughs> the uh, what I think uh, we'd be interested in doing is getting this out to, to uh, the community for you know uh, some comment, uh, and then. Uh, identify a time when the uh, community can vote on it <coughs> and how. And then I was um, been delayed. Um, I was requested uh, by our to speak at uh, one of their conferences about this. Mm -hmm. happen soon too. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, I think they invited me and Mark Fryer at the same time to have a conversation. Okay. Have a conversation in front of uh, them or uh, a private conversation? I forget that, not a subcommittee in front of them, and I forget the name of the committee, or else it probably should be given the mark. Uh, then I guess Waterbury Area Development Committee, which functions it. as the town's economic development committee. Okay. Anyone know that happened, you know? <coughs> they meet yeah. the first Wednesday of the month. Or, you know, right? or did. So I guess it'll happen. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't know if we need a motion on this uh, at this point. Uh, any further discussion? Hmm? There's a second for it. Oh. Which, is, which is codifying existing practice. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, yeah. The, the uh, manager's uh, responsibilities. That was a little tougher, right? 
Um, and I spent a, I spent a little bit of time on the phone with, with Jim Barwell, who's got a fifth with EMS. Um, it's in a lot of town charters and everyone is a little bit different. And to some extent, there's no right answer here. Um, the, I think that the manager hire appoint discipline remove all town employees is what you were looking for. We came up with the planning director, um, sub subject to the personnel rules, which we've adopted. So I think that's straightforward and easy enough. The second one is more interesting and a little more difficult to codify. Um, many town charters have some language related to the manager fixing compensation and benefits, and it's phrased a little bit differently in all of them. And we came up with the language um, with compensation ranges and schedule of benefits approved by the select board because the select board historically adopts the benefit package. And compensation ranges can be thought of as a number of different ways, but essentially it logically means that if the budget for a position, if the budget for, I think about last fall, we, when Bill was still the manager, I was here, he came before you and said, we need to increase wages for highway department employees to retain people. Um, we're within budget because we had a vacancy. Um, it essentially limits my ability to some extent to, to give someone a, a far above standard raise without checking them with the select. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's reasonable. Um, and then we had talked about the last time we talked about charters, for the third sentence, we had talked about um, hiring, um, the hiring process, especially around department heads. Um, really the third and fourth sentence. So the third sentence essentially says, you know, Katarina Lasias can hire the summer rec staff, not me, uh, which is totally fine. Uh, but I have the discretion to say yes or no to that and to do it myself. Uh, the fourth sentence we talked about before, Stell actually just passed a charter where the manager checks in with the select board and the select board has like five or seven days to get back to them. And the more I thought about that and talked it through with Jim Barlow, uh, I just concluded that's a little bit awkward. And I think keep the language simple. Um, you approve the hire. The form of approval can be however we want and however formal or informal we want to do it, depending on the hire and the manager and the board at the time. But I don't think we need to specify an exact process. It's about a relationship. Mm -hmm. But, but the, we, you would need our approval before the hire is come to us. Before department head, correct. Right. I don't have any problems with this. Yeah. I, think, I think it's a good change. Yeah, this is great. The planning commission is moving as we speak, and I'm just hoping no more zoning administrative recommendations needed from that in the future. <laughs> That's all I can find from any of it. And that, that points out the awkwardness because the planning commission recommends to the zoning administrator, but really the zoning administrator works with the BRB. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, a different board gets a role in the hiring process by law. Yeah. That's hard. Well, I think that's a case because in a lot of municipalities, the planning commission acts as kind of both BRB and planning commission. That's, I think, where, where that falls. I think you're 100% correct. I know being a former CRP person, it was very awkward where, you know, the line of the party. Yeah. Do we have to make a motion on this? Did you find that out? <coughs> um, depends what you want to do with the You want to simply engage in a more public conversation and, and move towards a vote. That was my intention. Um, I think uh, we'd want to get this out uh, for more public comment. We've already mentioned uh, conversation with uh, the committee at uh, RW. Um, certainly want to get input from them. Mike? My recommendation at least would be to have some sort of a public meeting before, some kind of before town meeting and have it voted on by the I think it has to be voted on by the charter has to be approved at a town meeting, but right. it, it can be a special town meeting. And right. if you wait until March, you're 
missing the legislative session. So yeah. my advice would be to schedule a essentially a public meeting to discuss a charter special public for order at least. some point in August and then work towards a public vote at a special town meeting in November because the legislative session starts early this year. Do you think with everything going on, August is an appropriate time? You know, there's a lot going on in our community around the region. I wonder if we're going to have appropriate attention. Maybe if we delay it into the fall, that may be more appropriate. <laughs> so, what's the, Karen, can you, can you remind me, what's the warning timeline if we're going to have a special town meeting? I think it's 30 days. So, if we had a special town meeting, First Tuesday in uh, November. November. Uh, we have a, we have thirty days before, so we have an early October. So really, if we're doesn't have to be the beginning of August, but if we're going to have a couple months of comment, we want to start pretty soon. Yeah. Right. I think we, you know, people's attention are going to be a little bit more right at this point. And the reason I suggest sooner rather than later is because the legislature has to approve it, the governor has to sign it. It would take the state, it takes the state tax department two full quarters to implement it. So if you if you miss a session, you, you effectively miss a year. So even if you follow the schedule which is outlined, you're looking at cash in the bank in 2025. Um, so the way the few months really could mean 2026. So the last week of August, would be six weeks from now. Does that feel appropriate? Bear, like bear in mind, I'm not going to be here. So when do you? When do you? I'm gone in August. The entire month, the whole month, yeah. two weeks. Right. So, two and weeks that's fine, long. but I just won't be here to lend yeah. like administrative help to to it. That's all. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're proposing comment, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. we're proposing yeah. comment in August. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 It's just what people do. I mean, I think it's a fair point. I think capacity is real. Mm -hmm. And at a, yeah. at a prior meeting, uh, we had a policy about this. I can go on Trinkwood Forum and other places and advertise the meeting, advertise the policies, some yeah. of the revenue, some of the things that could be funded for this. I'm also wondering, Tom, if it's something you can take on or one of us should, but a layperson explanation of why one might want to do this. I guess I would just say as someone who lives in the nerdy municipal world, a memo on a town charter is a thing I might read and understand. And um, but I guess I would just say to me, fortunately, it is incredibly straightforward language, but it would be like, here's the one page of what we're proposing, and here's essentially the explanation of how it differs or is a modification from current practices, which in many cases it is not, it is a codification of existing practices, but I think having a lay language explanation of that might be a useful tool in like public a, outreach. Like a what and why? Right, and just explaining it like, you know, a man, you know, water right operates under the general laws of the state of Vermont, thank you Bill Shuffle, um, and so, you know, this is following that and further specifying where it varies. Um, I can do that. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. Follow up on Alyssa's comment. I think I I have received, and I'm sure some of you may have also received those same emails already with some concerns about because they probably saw the charter, you know, listed on you know tonight's meeting agenda. So you know, there are gonna be, you know, people are gonna want to know. You know, everyone, when there are new taxes, you know, there are concerns. And I know people have expressed the whole issue that we're a, you know, recreation kind of, you know, to have more, more taxes on, you know, so, you know, this is going to be a lot on the recreation sector, you know, it's going to be mm -hmm. fair. I think there's a concern. Yeah, I think there will be. And for me, that would be reason to have a public meeting earlier rather than later. Uh, yeah. uh, so I was going to suggest, uh, I think we have a meeting scheduled for the 21st of August. Why not do it at one of our regular scheduled meetings? I don't think we have a tremendous amount going on in August, but we don't have, haven't heard from the SEC either. So Steve has I believe finalized the final committee meeting 
<laughs> and I believe that is August 3rd. He just had me put it on the calendar, yeah, but it's like. So the first um, select board meeting on the 7th could be the hope day the uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Uh, and then we wouldn't move uh, the. There was some discussion of moving our next meeting to the 31st uh, if the uh, recovery efforts uh, indicated that we were going to need to move earlier rather than later. It will be three weeks from tonight. Uh, but I'm sensing that maybe we don't and that we can just go with the regular scheduled meeting on the 7th. How long will we be missing the services of uh, our town clerk? Yes. Hi, this is not. Person, but I won't be down at seven. It's okay. I'll watch the recording. But I just you got to participate from over there, or no? I'm, I yeah. have tickets to an event, but oh. yeah, I'm excited to stand up. Sounds fun. Um, yes, I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's okay. I'm not. I I think we should have it on a day keep moving forward, and I'll you know watch afterward, assuming technology works. Yeah, definitely. Well, Orca might be here for that oh, too. Okay. Yeah, Alyssa. Less may be the one to suggest additional meetings. I wonder about the prudence of scheduling a meeting for the 31st that we cancel instead of later needing to struggle to find a meeting date prior to August 7th for some reason, in case there was some sort of emergent need. But if the board thinks we're good, then I will not be the lone one to have. Well, that the space is open that night anyway, so it's okay, not like so it could always be a special meeting. Yeah, it's not, it's not putting meeting. anybody out to have it that day. And okay. If all things remain the same, we sort of lost it. Uh, what do you propose? I was just saying we should pencil it in in our metaphorical calendars, and best case, we could erase it as opposed to needing to scramble late. But I am a meeting enthusiast. As, as an additional instead of a uh, yeah, yeah, she wants one more. Meeting. Oh, yeah, sorry. Karen, if there was so so Karen has future calendars saved already, so they're not even metaphorical. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, why don't we touch on that at the end of the night then? Sure. Um, uh, if we're okay with the plan going forward with the charter, we don't need a motion. Okay. By consensus, the select board is supportive proceeding with the charter as outlined in the memo. Okay. Update on crushed stone supply. So last Monday morning at 10 a.m., I was in a, I'm going to go a little later than 10, and I was in a meeting with the uh, a bunch of folks from uh, the Department of uh, Forests and Parks, um, and they do um, unit management plans um, that they that they adopt uh, in essence. And uh, this was put on their agenda by Julie Moore, who's the who's the head of ANR. Um, at my request to have this conversation, it was an interesting meeting because as I was as I was talking, that row was rapidly filling in. Oh, it was wow. dry when I started and three feet deep when I ended, so I was trying to concentrate, but at the same time, I was throwing pencils at the wall. Woody saying, uh oh, is there, what's going on here? I haven't seen that flood before. <laughs> uh, but it was, turned out to be a pretty lengthy and, and good conversation. Um, you know, what I, what I said was there's no, there's no town planner desire at this point to do any blasting. The government just cleaned up all the loose detritus and that uh, Woody had uh, taken a sample um, and it's got the got the right qualities that we could could subbase mm -hmm. uh, for the roads, and we certainly need it. Um, they they asked a lot of questions. Um, one theme was around that every all the neighboring towns are hurting from the close of the Bolton Pit, and and you know, are we also you know, can't we also quickly get form some interestful agreement with all, with four or five neighboring towns to explore something I said no that that's not an easy proposition um, I think in their minds they were suggesting that we band together and hire you know a geologist or some form of engineer to, to find suitable sites in the area I said but we can't just do that and agree to split the cost because we have to agree upon using the material in the end otherwise we're just paying for you know Duxbury's Sites development, yes. So it's a, it's a more complicated proposition. You've yes. got to think through the whole thing. You know, it's, it's in theory a lot of money and time invested for no gain. Right. So it can be difficult. Um, we talked about that. 
we spend some time on the history of the property. They asked about neighbor concerns. Um, I met with the most immediate neighbor who really indicated to me he, he didn't have a major issue with this. There was a couple of rocks that were of importance to The him. guy up behind? Uh, Glenn Anderson. Oh, Glenn. There were a couple of couple rocks up there that were of some meaning to him, but aside from that, he, he really didn't uh, he really didn't see a, a huge challenge with it, a huge problem, and I, mean, I think he appreciated the fact that we had the conversation. Um, there's a neighbor behind it who I believe is a second home, mm -hmm. um, but I talked about that, you know, in, in speaking with, you know, a contractor who crushes, they don't want to come and, and do a little bit here, a little bit there, there need to be a schedule that would work with the neighbors and work with the contractor. Contract would want to bring their equipment and do it all. Get a crush. Yeah. They could. Um, and that could also happen at a time when in the parking lot for Hunger Mountain is not that heavily utilized. So, I, you know, we thought it was reasonably workable to come up with a time frame and a schedule that could work for everyone there. Um, they asked about what they said is we talked about the need about whether or not the town would need to own the land. And I said my desire wasn't to own the land because. If the town would buy the land from the state forest, we'd have to do a land swap, yeah, have to do greater, a swap. greater equal value, and that's complex. I said, so our desire would be to lease the land and, and, and ultimately give it to you. And I talked about how there's already parking overflow challenges, so you would have a flat site when we're done right next to the parking lot. Squad so would have a parking lot. Um, I thought that was well received. There were a couple questions and people asked about sharing in the supply. Mm -hmm. And I said, in essence, I don't think anything is off the table at this point, but the economics have to work for us. So if you're going to take 30% of what's crushed, that might not work financially. So you know, anything is possible. We just want access to the stone, but it's got to work for both parties, obviously. Um, talked a little bit about um, some of the heat flood land nearby that, that abuts the state parcel and how that could, in theory, be, be part of a land swap uh, that involves a whole other board. Um, but they they raised that. They're they're all well aware of, of the flood of land set about the state parcel and, and had some interest in it. Now, the other issue that was raised that wasn't an issue for us before. Um, so the old site has, I walked through it um, the other week. Um, everyone seemed to agree uh, that it's not a wetland, it's a hard rock bottom. Um, it's just sort of overflow rainwater. Um, I don't think anywhere, when I walked through it in my boots, never got anywhere going close to going over the boots, just some frogs, things like that there. Uh, but on the map, there is a stream that flows down the mountain through the edge of the site. I didn't find it, I didn't see it. Uh, Bill Woodruff, you know, said there's a, there's a culvert nearby, but it's really a seasonal stream. But they talked about how some work could be done there to enhance that stream and that they would actually like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought they were they were receptive. The door certainly was not closed. I think they liked the fact that there could be some overflow parking for Hunger Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> didn't appear to be a, a wetlands issue according to anyone's um, according to anyone in the conversation. So um, you know, the next step is to just keep talking with them. And, and if they're interested in this, it would go in their management plan for that chunk of state forest. So try to push forward with leasing that uh, property. Yeah. And uh, any, any closer ideas to how much uh, crushed stone we would, that would generate for us on the years? I spent quite a bit of time with Bill Woodruff estimating um, and looking at past budgets, and it's it's really tough to do because um, <clears throat> sometimes the invoices we get aren't that specific. It, we we'll, we'll, we go through all the invoices, and it will say you know ten yards of material, but it won't specify necessarily what material it was. Oh. So, to our best estimate, we we average um, in terms of material and and trucking. Um, for material and labor, $60,000 60, ish of town taxpayer money. Um, so it's it's poking at a. That's 60000 a year. 60000 a year. So it's. Now that is just material that we buy directly, and that's just, that's just labor that 
we use to haul it or contract out. That doesn't include if we decide we're going to rebuild a thousand feet of gravel road somewhere and contract that entire piece out. So that's mm -hmm. our our direct that's purchases, our direct space. labor. Yeah. But in, in doing the math with the closure of the Bolton pit, um, those costs close to double. Well, you know, depending mm -hmm. on where you're going from, you're you're going from 10 miles to 25 miles mm -hmm. for your material. Um, and you know, we're talking staff that aren't free and trucks that might get three or four miles miles a gallon empty and two to three full. Yeah. Um, so it's a and the biggest hit is just the labor time to to haul it all. Yeah. Do we have to go all the way to Hinesburg or is there another site? Uh, and the material, we get some from Richmond, but generally it's um, self buried. Uh, yeah, Mark, uh, Tom. Um, when I uh, moseyed on over to Duxbury yesterday, uh, I did notice quite a bit of crushed granite mixed in with their uh, gravel on the good roads. And I was like, well, if they're getting it, this is an issue that's been keeping me up at night um, for no particular reason. So, <clears throat> I don't know who they're getting that from, but if, if there is some sort of substance, some other sort of rock that we can mix gravel with to stretch our gravel supply, I think that's something we should definitely look into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nick, what's we'll about that and see where you might know what the other times are doing. I suspect we're all from the same right. local sources. Yeah, there was uh, the town of Bolton sent out a message to all the slow fords uh, around uh, in this area, Kingston, <laughs> Duxbury, uh, more town and us, asking basically the same question with the uh, Bolton pit closing. What, what are we going to do? Chris? I think I probably can answer your question there about the granite. Um, McCullough, their supply, their pit out in South Ferry is running short. This is, I was told by McCullough himself. Their pit is running short of gravel, so they're actually buying granite <coughs> and crushing it, mixing it with what gravel they have left to be able to try to get there. Um, the bigger concern that I have, one of the concerns that I have, is that. With storms like the ones we've just had, the enormous amount of washouts that some towns have received, water age, by that bullet, uh, to what some towns are not, um, those resources are just getting rough, gobbled up in that uh, And talking, talking to the McCullers, um, they told me about some of the pits that they have that are you know, on their way to. In sight. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I would have conveyed to the Agency of Natural Resources or whoever it was at the meeting is that you can't continue to grow these towns and produce more and more uh, infrastructure <coughs> without some form of ability to maintain it in the future. Unless they're willing to allow new avenues of resources, such as steep road quarry, uh, it's going to become more the environmental impact alone become more and more uh, desperate as time goes on, because you won't be able to have the resources to maintain to maintain the infrastructure that you created. And it's amazing just how much resources every town uses on a yearly basis. Uh, it's quite staggering, actually. Uh, the other thing will be is the pit for the quarry on Sweet Road. Uh, I've been talking to the fellows about that one as well. Crushing the bigger aggregate, the five inch minus and such to use for some base as opposed to the three quarter inch. That rock is so hard, I suspect if you were to crush it down to three quarter inch or inch and a quarter, um, it's so hard to like run that it's popping a lot of tires. Uh, 
Right. People experienced that on Route 2 when they were when they turned it to dirt. Um, my question, I guess, becomes the farther out we have to look for gravel and the farther we need the farther we have to go, at what point does it become more cost effective just to pay for roads? Like how many years till it's more cost effective to pay for road? <laughs> I don't know offhand. Um, yeah, I know. It's a lot more than that. I mean, <laughs> you know, a grab Little River Road we're paving that was paved years before. So there's a pretty reasonable sub base there that we can we can put a code on. But areas that have never been paved. Um, the best I can tell you is probably a dozen years ago, I worked on a project where we paved a gravel road. And at the time, we thought built the sub base the right way, and it was a million mile 12 years ago mm -hmm. in a place where there was no shortage of local materials on much cheaper land where you can get them. So, I don't know, two, three million a mile to pave a road. Was that the right way and pave it? Others can probably comment more, but it's it's an awful lot of money. Let's put it that way. Alyssa. I was just going to ask if there's next action steps needed from the sector this evening. Very much I appreciate the update and your willingness of Chris raising this. And I know I don't want to say beating it down worse, but for many years being a champion of this um, and Tom being able to be in the meeting and provide updates, um, it seems promising that they're willing to consider it and entertain it. And I'm just wondering if there's anything else you need this evening or if it was just an update. Just an update, nothing this evening. Thank you. Keep you posted. All right, let's move forward. Um, allocation of ARPA funding. Um, Tom, prepare the memo for us uh, and just go over the yes. major points. Um, it's a little bit of, of accounting. Um, a wash in, in, in flood fatigue, but the short version is we have about $280,000 in ARPA funds that are. Um, Uncommitted from the town's perspective. Um, we've got $416,000 spent, $245 committed, and the balance is at, at $278. Mm -hmm. and so, what I'm, what I'm requesting you do is simply uh, approve an accounting entry where we move the ARPA funds out into the general fund, and then that would reimburse the town's general fund for some gen general government expenses, which is one of the approved categories. And that doesn't mean the ARPA funds are suddenly gone. Um, it just means that from the from a reporting perspective, the ARPA funds are, are then entirely committed and gone and spent. And actually in, in the short term improvement because uh, with that whole undesignated fund balance that would increase because of this. Oh, motion. Oh, okay. That's, that's fine. My only question is the 200000 on reappraisal. We've discussed that that seems to be something that may be in flux due to both legislative action and um, studies and capacity constraints around contractors in the city. Is that funding we should, well, I guess you haven't outlined the general fund spending plan for it, but. I guess yeah. my only concern is, do you have any concerns with that being spent within the ARPA timeline? Because right now we're I do. accounting for it through that. I do. So, so we will likely come back. And but that would be a subsequent. Do a subsequent amendment. I've also got um, the senior center doesn't have a final number. The town bridges may come in a little bit less. Um, you know, downstream, I think, is going to request their $100,000. Um, in the spring when I hope they're there, but they may not be. Mm -hmm. um, same with the ambulance service. That's a pretty quickly developing project that's positive, but so yeah, there will be a final amendment. Uh, there may be two, two amendments in the future. Mm -hmm. um, we just were impacted by an unforeseen uh, weather disturbance that uh, may affect uh, the economy of the town. Um, some businesses uh, and uh, other infrastructure, uh, running in Whiskey Street. Um, so, and that, many unforeseen demands on the money. And on that note, what should help is just before this, the, the e flood board approved this, in essence, for me to engage in some of the businesses directly impacted by the flood, directly meaning they were wet 
mm -hmm. um, and offer some short-term interest, uh, short-term more on zero interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a lot of funds left in this fund, do you? Um, you know, maybe a couple hundred. Um, we, we also talked about NIFA has an old fund they call the property management fund that used to be to manage the parks and there's about 150 there and so maybe that can be liquidated to increase this depending on the business demand but my pitch to efud was you know these businesses have insurance policies these businesses may have FEMA reimbursement all that takes time mm -hmm. so maybe we can help them get over the gap so efud gave us the park but they didn't give us the maintenance money that they had saved to uh, maintain it that's correct <laughs> Somebody was asleep at the wheel there. Uh, <laughs> out for another <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've never been phrased like that. Made it put that in to be thrown out. Do we have any expectations of what the potential demand is at this? I know probably it's two or too early. Um, it's too early, but at the same time, I think if we're offering businesses interest-free money, um, I think the men will be high. Uh, yeah. I'd rather do that than some of the other alternatives. But uh, you can go to maybe low interest, but zero is four years of good number. And, and, and the board, the EFUD board, didn't authorize me to sign agreements. So I've got to go back to them with some specifics. Um, but the thought is, in general, we're, we want to tie it to uh, you know, some short-term loss of business or, or you know, maybe you would expect to get a certain amount back from the amount of your insurance policy that you can pay for the bridge. And that would all come out of the e-fund funds, not town money. Correct. But as of tonight, you're just asking us to reclassify the Apple funds uh, as outlined below. Yes. We have a motion to that effect. Slowly. <laughs> <laughs> start start a paragraph two. Okay. Um, I move to transfer ARPA funding awarded to the town of Waterbury for eligible uses in this total amount of two hundred and seventy-eight thousand nine hundred and sixty-three dollars and seventy-three cents as outlined to pay for 2023 expenses for general government regular pay. Fire department regular pay and general government clerk pay. So I hit what I needed to hit in the harbor for stuff. Second. Okay, I have a motion that's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The funds have been reclassified and we'll discuss this going forward. Um, Good night, Chris. Thank you. Night, Chris. Very good night. Night. All right. Uh, next meeting agenda. And we had talked about moving us to the thirty first. Then we talked about Not keeping it on the seventh. <laughs> and then we talked about maybe, maybe holding it on the thirty first. Anyway, why don't we just add another meeting for funds? Yeah, there is one notable asset that we would have on the thirty first, which is that our town clerk would be present. But move it or add it. Well, <laughs> I yeah. don't understand. I'd, I'd like to know. Move or add. Right. That's, I think what I heard earlier was that the suggestion was to add it. Mm -hmm. My question is would, if we moved it, would the Hope Davis designation be ready by the 31st? Not that I understand. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then I see like we should not move it. We mm -hmm. should leave it. Yeah. And then the question is, do we want to have one on the books just in case we need a general emergency update meeting and then we can cancel it? Or as Karen said, the room's open. I'm waiting. Schedule a meeting if we need one. Okay. I can always put a placeholder on the calendar. Uh, Kane, then Tom. I was going to say we could schedule one. We could fill it with all this stuff in the parking lot. <laughs> and then if we need to add stuff, we can okay. put stuff back those, in the parking lot. Those things have are, are been parked there for a long time. Yeah, I know. They need to jump. We're scheduling any of our brands that are able to hold panel things. Well, we haven't been able to handle it. Essentially, I'm just saying, make the agenda. Yep. Place yeah, the yeah, you have a, a reasonable point. Tom, you had a comment. So I would suggest scheduling the meeting on the 31st on the parking lot. And, and I think keep the meeting simple. 
because I think the Hope gave you presentation on the 7th could take up an hour. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking for the 31st, um, we could have a deputy tree warden. Um, Ooh. Wasi could, that would be a good opportunity for Wasi to give an update on the capital project. Mm -hmm. um, schedule of fees isn't good because a lot of that's recreation in the fields and, and Katarina's out. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any, you know, I, I think in general, uh, that was one of the usual, there are minor things come mm -hmm. up, but I, those were the items on my list. Can we uh, say that we've talked about gravel supply? So that's how yeah. we can do that. Yeah. Way to go, Roger. All right. I think for the 31st, I do think if we can change the, the genre, but not the subject on our past people, mm, thank because, you. Yes. because of our recent events, yeah. um, I, we should just make sure that we're updated on all of that. Cool. Yeah, we just call that housing. housing. Um, yeah, I, I like framing that genre though. Yeah, because we, yeah, we can do a housing update because of the task force meeting on Thursday morning. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. So you want it called what? Housing people or just housing? Housing, housing, housing update. update. Okay. And remove that from the parking lot on house Thank people. Okay. I also, I mean, the item here is emergency management training. <laughs> In light of current events, I do wonder about some sort of debrief lessons learned. I mean, I love because Tom brought the way down too soon. Is that what that hand is? Yeah, so I'm dear. Uh, I wasn't trying to stop you. I was just panicking. Yeah, no, I was just thinking of a like assessment of where we're at. What would it wouldn't be a bad idea. Things to know while it's relatively fresher. Yeah, right. Under there's, a Google, um, there's the Google document about sort of long term lessons. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know how to share Proposals around resiliency we just talked about. Again, I'm not saying we're going to have an action item, but at least a preliminary conversation. Because after I read, we had, and we're in St. Leo's Hall, had a whole major meeting about resiliency and what plans. And I think we did some of them, but I don't think we did a lot of them. You have 22 yeah. actions in a report, Mike. It's a great report. You can read it. Yeah. And I think we have to draw. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I'm looking right now to see if that's sharing the whole select board, but it would be a good one to that report. I will find it. It's no, not the good. our new the new one that where we started writing taking notes. Oh, um, and I, for reference, I'm around from it's called a VDOT report. I don't know what that acronym stands for, and they were done all across the state after I read it. That's yeah, the 22 items. I, I believe. Yeah, the Mont Downtown Action Team. Whoop. So oh, this is for the 31st, correct? Right? Yeah. I think yeah. so. Okay. Yes, yeah, so all these are moving to the 31st. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll have a big fun night. Like it's happening. Sorry. Everybody. So when we do the 31st and the 31st? We're meeting 31st and the 7th and the 21st. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 We used to take some of up now. We just well, I'll meetings. remind you, you missed, you didn't have two meetings in July, right? Because we didn't meet the week of the fourth. That's right. We missed one so in July. So we made up for it with five. So, but now we're having, we're having two. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good stink eye reminder. <laughs> I was like, no meetings in July. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. That feels like four years ago. Yeah. Uh, very, very good. All right. You guys remember the third when everything was nice? No. no, I don't remember no. the summer being nice at all. So you did give Deputy Tree Warden Wasi housing update and emergency management review debriefing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then and hopefully something. I'll have minutes. Do you want to throw a uh, road salt in there just for funsies? <laughs> no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want road salt in? I'm not ready I'm just no, copy. we're not ready for road salt. I'm just copying cash. Wait, wait, wait. And I thought of Katarina being gone. I just can't remember if we said, we just keep pushing out these things. I don't know if we said it out loud, but if you happen to publish the gratitude portion of our, I just, she came, she was hired and on her first day was a, a, a massive historic catastrophe and has not- With no name. But it weren't, yeah, we had nothing. <laughs> um, we have, we, I just like- I put her in one of my updates the other day. Thank you. I just yes. swear, the day yes. after she was hired, we had, I started doing web updates yeah. every day. 
And the first day we had a recreation update. They said that <laughs> recreation was going to be back because they had been off for a day and that they were going to be going to um, Brookside with the middle school because the church is flooded and there's something else. And then at the end, they said, and this information comes to us <laughs> from Good. our new recreation director, who was hired on Monday as Jack wrote, and her first day, she started Monday, yeah. as Jack wrote, yeah. building up with floodwaters. Mm-hmm. And I said, Brett Water, I hope to catch up with her sometime soon Perfect. to introduce Yeah, me too. <laughs> Well, you know, so, and then yeah. when I, I saw her the other day, she took a long time on vacation. I'm like, well, I'm going to give way to her. Like, all right, we'll talk in August. Okay. So, I, um, just, yeah, I, put her, I put her name up. I really should have gotten a picture of her. I could have put her face in it too. But we'll catch up with her. Perfect. And I and I did, I told her, I said, did mention you the other day. Yeah. So, all um, right. yeah, it's been, I'm um, just thinking about her. her and she I say thanks for all your coverage, which I haven't had time to Yeah, she's yeah. Like, I just see it in the inbox. I read the record. I know. I just, it's been oh, um, <laughs> are you still doing the meeting? You said you're going to be doing a meeting in the morning, but then more tomorrow or like every the rest of this week. Humans will be in this building through Friday, and then we'll reassess. Okay. So it'll be some combination of Liz, Alyssa, and myself, and then rotating volunteers. How much is emailing you guys? Going out to lunch in three days. Whoa! Yeah, what's going to happen? <laughs> Wow. Ooh. My 98 year old mother in law said to me, it was on the phone with us yesterday and said, oh, I haven't gotten the newsletter yet. Where's the newsletter? I said, I'm still working on it. I'll get it out as soon as I can. And then she asked us, it's about us, me going out of town with my daughter. And she said, Well, who was going to do the news? <laughs> and she's so, in Pennsylvania. And I'm getting grief from my mother in law. So we all yeah, Pennsylvania okay. needs to know. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going to be back with Well, before you leave back, you know, has been gone. Um, he left last Tuesday, dumped in the pile of pictures, and um, he'll be back tomorrow. So I'm going to put him in charge, and anything that happens, he'll come up with photos. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. words. Uh, hey, that's what I told him. I said, we're all set. They're worth a thousand yeah. words a piece. They're like, what well, we just a picture a day? You'll be good. Um, and then, anyway, I can, you know, I can check emails and stuff. Tell <laughs> one, one other piece for a future meeting, just so you don't, you don't miss this, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so the EFUD board would like a joint meeting. Um, they talked about giving the some of the employees who are in the thick of things a little reward. Yeah. Can I approve it now? Yeah. I can sense it. I'll make a motion. They wanted to do that. We talked uh, about it. As a group. They wanted to do it. They didn't want to do it for e fund employees Her. without. Yeah. Yeah. Group. Did they have a proposed time? Uh, no, that was setting, setting meetings. Join us on the 31st. Yeah. yeah. As part of our debrief and resiliency brainstorm, there's a resiliency angle to that. Come on. That's a great idea. And I'll, I'll put that to them. Okay, let me know because that have to be warned as a joint meeting. Did you have to be there? Yeah. 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 So, Car show. Car show. Car show. Car show. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sure. oh, I left. I left him on that chair. Oh, here's some. Sorry, let me just paper that. Please say it's very comprehensive application. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, I just need to stop now. We're not going to be the first select board in 66 years to say no. <laughs> and start charging rotary. Oh, my God. We have a reputation. All right. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Thanks for working, everyone. Everybody's taking a little break at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Karen, Tom, and I will uh, attach uh, some times to these uh, agenda items and uh, rough out the agenda on Friday. Um, uh, do we need to move into executive session at this point? Uh, well, there's a dog bite. First yeah, we, do, we, do, we deliberate uh, the dog bite and Bubba. We don't need you, to. you do not have to. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also, the nice thing about the deliberative session is that you could adjourn and have conversations over email that you normally couldn't. Mm-hmm. So there's essentially open meeting law doesn't apply to your email at that point where three of you can meet over coffee and talk about it. It's a special thing. It's like it's a, a special thing. The development <laughs> would be more to the frequent. But I would, suggest, we're not I would suggest in this case, um, doesn't strike me as highly controversial. Um, you might want to just do an open session. Deliberate, yeah. Especially since it's um, it's don't happen that often, fortunately. Um, and <laughs> there's there's there have been two bites, but it's been some time, and there was some time between the bites, so you, you don't have necessarily a vicious dog on the loose right. that did something yesterday. Um, 
I just think it's, it's not necessarily something you can't comment on public if you choose to. Okay. Um, I'll start. Uh, just to be clear, we're in open session. Yes, I mean, if, if people would feel more comfortable uh, and we'll have to go into executive session anyways, uh, we can do it there. Uh, we've got a recommendation from the manager. Um, anyone have a, a drummer either way? We can discuss it if there's follow up. We'll discuss it okay, um, yeah. let's go forward. I was concerned that the, the dog uh, is outside without identification. Uh, and that's an easy thing to insist yeah. on. Mm -hmm. um, and we heard from two residents that are concerned uh, about the public safety in the neighborhood, uh, with apparently some reason. So that's a, some remedial issue that needs to be taken on. I, I was a bit concerned about requiring a muzzle because as Danny mentioned, it does traumatize the dog. Yeah. But if it's like, it has to be fully supervised or restrained and then, and, and with the goal of going to a muzzle, like, then you have to leave it there because like the trainer could give updates and say, no, I think I've been six weeks or eight weeks or whatever, but um, that's a lot of follow-up and it's okay for safety, but um, if it you know, cannot be left alone in the backyard and cannot be unrestrained in public or just shouldn't be in public, like, uh, you know, should not be unlocked, obviously, but um, fully supervised or restrained in the backyard. But yeah, I, 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 would, I would not recommend as anyone go to just put a smudge on a dog's pool. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing is, I don't feel comfortable making a decision tonight about anything like with the backyard, like having to have a dog on a leash in hand in her backyard without going to the fence. I didn't understand the fence conversation. So if our if it's like, oh God, I'm so tired. So I guess like the idea was like, are we are we requiring her to have her dog in her backyard with the fence closed on a leash? And if that's the recommendation, I'd rather us look, go look at the fence and see like, can that dog get out of that fence? Is it literally closed in with a six foot fence with no gate and if with enforcement and if it's fully supervised, you know, that, that's a different conversation. Okay. I agree with Dave that we should go with the property. Um, I did, I made a note and usually I don't. But <laughs> When I'm listening to people talk because it distracts me from listening. But um, if she says the property is the way it is now, she changed it. She's got six foot fences spanning the whole property or whatever. We haven't seen it. Uh, with the amount of pure hypotheticals that the accusing parties were lobbying at her, like what if it bites a kid? I've had a husky that's jumped over a seven foot fence. These are all hypotheticals. Doesn't, yes, two dogs were attacked. This is a problem that needs to be dealt with, but it's just, it felt like it was wasting our time for them to try and like pull at our heartstrings about what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? They didn't. Those aren't things that have happened. If she's put up the fence, if she's willing to train the dog, I feel like she's taken more steps than we would have taken at this point, right? So, if she's if she's built the fence the way she says she has, we should absolutely not approve muzzling a dog under any circumstances. But if she also has a giant fence and no way for the dog to jump over, how big did she say it was? Thirty pounds? No, no it's fifty pound dog. Uh, then I don't think she needs to have the dog restrained in the backyard if it can't get out. That's what I mean. I just don't. I don't feel comfortable yeah. in that kind of opinion without seeing the fence. Yeah, and that's why. Well, why I asked uh, Ariel about uh, putting it on a runner, uh, because I think, you know, for me, that's a pretty reasonable compromise. Uh, if, if there is right. some way, I mean, it didn't seem like that stockade fence is a hundred percent, honestly. Uh, but 
I haven't been there to take a look. Maybe that's part of what we need to do. Uh, but if there is some possibility of that dog getting out, uh, then putting it on a runner in the yard seems like a good reasonable solution. Yeah. I've been in this situation more not neighbors or whatnot, but Deb was out in the woods walking our dog and the guy walking his Akita Pitbull mix attacked our dog. And he's lucky. I told him, I, you know, he was fairly responsible and he wound up paying for, you know, it was a fairly like a couple of thousand dollar event that we, we incurred. And I told him, I said, I'm I'm very concerned about my dog, but you're you relied upon a trainer or hand trainer that you weren't even familiar with using. Not that it just attacked my dog. What can your dog attack my your wife? my wife? I probably would not be sitting here very calmly. So I'm sorry about the situation. This is this is this is where I'm going. I do think I, I think dog control very seriously. Mm -hmm. I think I agree. I, I think what Amy was trying to be responsible by doing the fence and then the inner fence. But I do think one, I don't think it's unreasonable that it should be not on on some sort of a run and always be supervised with 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 a past history of you know you know violence. Then maybe you know, in five years or, or something, it's still a young dog. You know, once it's gone through training and stuff like that, maybe we could revisit, you know, the situation after Sorry. that dog is, you know, deep brain. Just take it very seriously. Okay. Can I add uh, one this. Uh, just one more comment because we're still having a couple of guys, even though there's nobody sitting here. Uh, I was attacked by a dog in the video. I don't think you like it. Um, <laughs> It's pretty vicious, not a good time to be had, but I, you know, I still think a dog can be rehabilitated, you know, it's not, yeah. they're not just killing machines, especially the big scary ones, they're not just killing machines, dogs get too rough, dogs get territorial, those behaviors can be trained out, so I just, I don't want to go, I don't want to get in the business of punishing dog owners or their dogs. Um, and I think runs are incredibly restrictive, but if the dog needs it for the time being, then the dog needs it for the time being. Um, mm -hmm. But I also, I, I don't have anything against pit bulls, but I was named by a line. There may be a reason. We all have a story, like we all have a story, and that's like, it's not, I didn't handle that. I just want to understand more specifically what we're requiring and that's what i was trying to get from aria but the <coughs> muzzled and or restrained someone who broke the flaps a long time ago but i'm not a current dog owner of just the and what it overlaps is how it overlaps with our current leash law on the book so like my understanding is all dogs in downtown water She's breach about her backyard. i understand i did but just that's what i want to outline really clearly because yeah. i feel like the information that i need to understand is what we're Required so at all times and outside. So, so the difference given this circumstance and what we've taken trust in Noni on is that it's including restraint for muzzle in, in like private property from a public health perspective. Are it, are we considering a run restraint though? Ariel did not. I guess that's just my question. I want to understand like what protocol we're calling for and what um, we're saying we meet that. And then I also just feel like we. It, it would be imprudent to not have a conversation about the follow-up. And I assume Ariel would be the one mediating complaints, but for the conversations about ordinances, just want to have that conversation about who's doing the follow-up if there's complaints. Um, uh, yeah, I think we are talking about having a restraint in the backyard. Uh, and uh, or uh, personal restraint, uh, and I would. I don't know why Ariel does not consider uh, a run uh, a restraint um, because uh, one of our previous uh, 
dog uh, animal control officers did require me to put up a, a run for my dog. Uh, did she did she say that or did she say she that it came off? off. Yeah, came she off. had an experience. So I think it, it would off. be like, can we get it checked and make sure it's secure so that right. it's up to standard? What So it's not like, oh, they tie it on a clothing line, you know, like right. make sure it's done well. Mm -hmm. I also think a restraint in a fence backyard is a very different scenario than a general run in general. I just have to say, in terms of, right, like a run for a dog in your open backyard and a run for a dog in a fully enclosed backyard are, about are, are very different in my mind. Well, so just to me, it's an alternate of a human sitting with a leash restrained in my backyard in yeah. a not human run thing in my fully fenced backyard, but fully fenced backyard is a condition, a baseline condition that I just want to say yes. out loud. Yes. That I, again, yeah, I think it's yes. important to articulate in just yes. what we're requiring because it's not, I guess that is issue. restrained outside at all times, but I don't know, I guess right. Just mm -hmm. that framing. Yeah, we have to word it. But. Yeah, we're requiring fence as a prerequisite, right? And then in addition, and then in addition to the fences, we have runs. Um, would anyone be interested in going and taking a look at the uh, backyard and say, the, you know, how, how secure that fencing is? Just video it. I'm having to go. Bring mm -hmm. mace. Just, just, no, I, just, I know that's it. That's my own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and then. Not my dog. So uh, I'm, I'm sure. not so sure we need to come up with a define solution tonight uh, but uh, as Tom was suggesting we could email um, on this particular issue uh, and then come up with a, uh, a deliberative statement yeah so I as a formality would move to enter deliberative session for the purpose of further discussion at the annual control hearing on 7 13 23 which my assumption is then gives us the we need to do whatever and get back to the involved parties when we need to do a decision. 731. Did you say 713. 713. I mean, oh gosh, 717. Sorry. No, that's, that's today. Oh, sorry. You wanted a date of when we were giving them the thing. Yeah, sorry, I was misunderstanding. I, I, well, first of all, I said the hearing. Huh? So I could just start over. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Just yeah. Take it from the top. <laughs> well, we moved to enter the delivery session oh, for okay. our. Um, sorry, it's been a long day. Um, dog bite hearing on July 17th um, to come up with a solution that we would communicate to the involved parties no later than July 31st. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Uh -oh. I'm so confused. Because I could go, no, I didn't was, know why I said that. Was, I lost it. She, she, she got a little off derailed at the beginning, which is yeah. part of my life. Anyways, I, well, I think we're good. Uh, so we have a motion. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? All right. We'll stay in deliberative session until the 31st, at which time we'll uh, deliver a statement on this uh, situation. So have to have that my goal will be to go over there this weekend, Saturday or Sunday, and I'll take a video and email it to the select board. Yeah. So okay. just yeah, I mean, I don't even need a particular video or not. So I could report. walk up there myself. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I, what I'd really like would be your assessment as to how secure this is. Yeah, because I just did not understand. Because you, you know the dog. I know the house. I looked at the house. My dad was bought that up. Yeah. And, and, you know, many of us are dog lovers. I think we all get that. But yeah. the, the issue here is that we need to preserve community safety. Um, can we immediately require the collar? Oh, yeah. How do we do that? Uh, I think we issue a, uh, a statement immediately saying that uh, oh, the dog must have a collar every time. Well, I guess that's weird because we're all right. Um, well, yeah. is that a law when you're in a fenced in backyard? I don't think so. Private mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would no, think I hand her the tag so on. that the dog can but have it on. Yeah. I always, my dog always mm -hmm. has a car on. Back anyway. I guess though it is weird to give a note back, check and note. It's weird to give one parameter if you suddenly give the parameters for the dog to get outside. Just Not necessarily. Okay. I think we just say, you know, immediately we want to have that dog because it's a, it's a public safety well, issue. Yeah. And, and until further notice, that dog can be uh, on the loose in that backyard. Well, and either way, if it is the if it is the town 
Well, then it's not us that should be statement. It's just enforcing the town rules. I'm, I haven't read the dog ordinance in a while. Yeah, so we, we can, we can just I'm pretty things. sure that dog's supposed to have a collar with his yeah. tag on. No matter what. Yes, the dog's license. Well, that's, I haven't read the dog ordinance. I've read it recently. I don't remember that piece, but I think that is in the ordinance, <laughs> or I think it's at least in blood, because the whole point is if they get off private property, yeah, they're, they're supposed to have a tag yeah. on. Yeah. So I think it simply <laughs> says your dog has. <laughs> Your dog has to wear its tags at all times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that might even be state. We could just put a broad statement out just to remind everyone that your dog is calling at all times. Yeah, but moving. We, we do have other things going on in this town. Um, so how, uh, can I have a motion on uh, issuing a mandate that the dog be uh, where it's Collar with its identification at all times. I move to require the defendant dog Chester, Chester to wear a dog collar with his tags on at all times. Okay, I guess we'd probably direct it to Amy Sharp because yeah. she'll be the one responsible. And I, I'll write her a letter. Okay. Uh, Just to memorialize it. Yeah, no, no. Do you need clarification on the motion? No, I don't think so. I just need a second. Okay. That's a lot. <laughs> anyway, second. There we go. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and Tom, if you wouldn't mind also mentioning that we're going to deliberate on the restraint issue and uh, come up with a directive by the 31st. Yeah, no, later. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Okay. Um, and did you say you had a uh, executive session? Yes. So I'll, I'll go get my folder. But in the meantime, if you want to make the, the two motions you have to make in the state of Vermont, but it's, uh, so the first would be the specific finding that a premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body involved at a substantial disadvantage. And the second motion will be entering the executive session for the purpose of. <laughs> I got uh, three words. Probable civil litigation. <laughs> so oh, probable mm -hmm. civil. Okay, no great. Right. Wait, can you so move that, or do you have to have? <laughs> no, we have to say this. We have to have a list. He just he can. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but Bart, Mike said I so move. I always oh. like that. The, mm -hmm. So you do executive session. No, yeah, 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 yeah. that okay. premature public knowledge of litigation involving the town of Waterbury would clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage. Do I have a second? Second. All there say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. And then I will move to enter executive uh, session of the session of probable civil litigation involving the town of Waterbury. Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any, absten any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We are now in executive okay, session. Just one second.